Hi everyone! Okay, so tonight we're gonna be moving forward into a new and different area of machine learning. Um, quick sound check for everyone. Is the music loud enough? Yesterday everybody really wanted to crank the Christmas carols, so let me know if you would like them louder. Um, so, so far we've been talking about supervised machine learning, which is the area of machine learning where our data has labels. It's kind of like, it's not easy mode exactly, but it certainly is a lot easier. And tonight we're going to be working with our first unsupervised learning model. And so this is where our data doesn't have any labels and we're kind of, we're not necessarily looking for, we're not looking to predict a particular outcome. We're looking for relationships or patterns in the data instead. Because, you know, previously with the Titanic data set, the Boston Housing data set, the Iris data set, the three, the three data sets that we've, we've used so far, um, what we've been able to do is we, we've had the answers. We knew whether people on the Titanic died or survived. Um, in our Iris data set, we knew the species. And so we were able to fit a model based on having the answers. But how do we predict that relationship between X and Y if we don't have the why. That's kind of the challenge of unsupervised machine learning. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how much you love unsupervised machine learning, the vast majority of situations that you'll find kind of out there in the world, the, in my opinion, the really interesting problems a lot of times are the unsupervised ones. Um, and goofy Lagrangian, say, how do I follow along? Do I have these codes with the data sets? So yes, you absolutely can follow along. There are a couple of different places that you can look. The code that we'll be doing tonight will be on GitHub after, after the stream, and the code for days one through four is already on GitHub. And the VODs are now available on YouTube. So the VODs for days one through four are already up on YouTube if you wanna get caught up. The VOD from tonight will also be posted on YouTube. And I am working on getting all of the Blackboard notes up as well. So everything, everything that you see tonight will be preserved in some, uh, some way, shape, or form. So do not worry if you've missed out on days one through four. Um, you, you've missed some cool stuff, but don't worry, there's a way to catch up. And we have our schedule, gosh, I always screw that up, right? It's over here on the, um, on the left. Yes, it's your left, my left too, but I point right. Anyway, the joy of, the joy of streaming, right? Um, the schedule over here on the left uh, shows you what we've done so far. So we've covered linear and logistic regression, our two reg regression methods. We've also talked about classification. We've talked specifically about decision trees, and we also did um, k-nearest neighbors. And then we talked about how we might ensemble uh, our decision trees into a random forest. And tonight we will be starting, like I mentioned earlier, our first unsupervised machine learning method. So get, get excited. All right, let's move right along to our Blackboard and, and start the fun. Let me make sure here I've got clearing the Blackboard from last night. It is saved though. Um, also, if I seem like I'm reading out your questions, maybe a little prescriptively, that's for the benefit of all of the YouTube people. So I realized that if this goes on YouTube, nobody has the chat. And so I might say your, say your username, say the question you've asked, and then answer it. Um, so that for the benefit of people watching the VODs, they'll be able to see kind of what, what you've asked. <laughs> All right, my friends. So what we're talking about tonight, unsupervised learning. And yes, Goofy Lagrangian, the link for GitHub is right there. Thank you, Loafbone, for being on top of that. I will be adding the GitHub and uh, Discord little commands to the bottom of the screen. So in future future streams, it will be a little bit easier for you to know all of the things that you need. Thank you for following Alex on the stack and welcome. Also, before we get started, major shout out. If you look above me, we have a new top donation because MC Childs is a wonderful human being and donated $50 to stream. Yeah, low phone, you literally read my mind. <laughs> so thank you so, so, so much for that because those donations really do help quite a bit. I put at least as many hours into each stream as the length of stream. 
So you might be like, oh, streams like two hours, that's easy, right? A lot of times I put two to three hours into prepping for each stream. So it means a lot um, to have that appreciation. And the WizKid71, thank you for following. Okay, so let's, let's before we even move on to K-means, what even is that? Supervised. Let's talk a little bit about unsupervised learning. And abstract form, thank you for following. Um, you spend the whole length of stream watching it, so. <laughs> but is that really a chore? I try to make it fun. Alrighty. Oh, thank you, Just As Good Joe. I'm glad. And Alex on the stack, uh, thank you and welcome. Thank you for your follow, but also um, thank you for your comment as well. It's nice to know so many people are, are really appreciating these streams. This is, it's been a blast, honestly. Like, I have to go back to work next week. And so, um, it's gonna, it's gonna be tough to not be able to spend every day <laughs> prepping a stream for all of you. Um, but we'll, we'll muddle through. Okay, so, unsupervised learning. Let's do a little bit of a review here, okay? So we've talked about machine learning in the past and different kinds of machine learning. And let's, let's broaden it a little bit with my terrible drawings. So this is all artificial intelligence, right? And we've talked about this definition before, but artificial intelligence, right, is where machines do tasks. Uh -oh. Machines do tasks that would require, we think would require human intelligence. Right? That's really what we're talking about when we talk about artificial intelligence. And Henning's there, thank you for following. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about AI. What is AI? AI is not necessarily robotics. The two fields intersect, but there's a common misunderstanding when people think about AI, they think about a robot. Um, it's not what we're talking about, okay? We're not talking about Skynet. Yet. Um, what we are talking about is how do we get machines to perform tasks that we think would require human intelligence. And oh my goodness, Ian Alex Hart with more gift subs. Thank you. You have gifted a total of three in the channel. I appreciate it. And that knife juggler, you're stuck now. You got to watch. You have no choice. That's, that's the secret subcontract that they don't tell you about. You, you, you get a sub and now you have to stay. No, that's horrible. Everyone's going to flee if I say that. <laughs> And um, I see Yogi, you say, thanks that you're doing this. My Jupiter notebook is ready. Good, prepare yourself. Um, An A war bear, no Skynet. I'm sorry, no Skynet yet. <laughs> Come back in a little bit. All right. So in the field of artificial intelligence, in when we are approaching, um, let's see, real quick, this 12 days of machine learning and doing boss. Oh, yay, thank you, Pai Lang. Yes, I'm, I'm quite pleased with how it's going. I think, I think I've been doing all right. Right? I'm keeping up with it. <laughs> Apart from that horrible sidetrack of getting getting a horrible cold. <laughs> um, thank you for following Microfluidic Seva here. I'm gonna butcher these names. Be patient with me. All right, so we are approaching the problem. How do we get machines to do tasks that would require human intelligence, right? And within this, there's kind of like two Actually, I'm not even going to split this fully in half because it's really, machine learning takes up most of this, okay? So within this, we have machine learning. Outside of this, we have what we've talked about before, right? Which is our rules-based AI. Our massive, massive, massive book of all of the possible conditionals for as many situations as we can think of. Machine learning is split into a bunch of different categories as well. So we have, how do I do this without making it look ugly? Um, whatever, I'm not an artist. We have supervised learning. We have, uns oh no, I do this every time, don't I? <laughs> we have unsupervised learning. And we have 
Not bad, I'm getting the hang of all these circles and stuff. Reinforcement learning. Okay, and a couple other magical, magical things happening here. We've got semi-supervised learning. You're here for the pretty drawings. Oh no, I'm sorry, George. I I'm so sorry to disappoint. <laughs> My drawings are not the greatest. Um, so under supervised learning, what have we done? We've done classification, right? Um, and in classification, we did our decision trees. We did um, K nearest neighbors. Right? We also did some regression. Linear. And logistic. All right, and this is the happy land where, where the data has, make a little heart. This is where our data has labels. So what happens in unsupervised learning? Well, unsupervised learning, right? This is the challenge. Um, I'm using light blue. This is where our data lacks labels. We have no labels, like I mentioned at the start of stream. So this is going to be things like clustering, which we're going to talk about tonight. Um, as a preview for, for next time, not next time, someone do the schedule command in chat for me. Um, at a soon-to-be-determined date, as soon as I can see the schedule in chat, um, we will be doing reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is a little bit strange. Um, this is... Uh, let's see, when are we doing reinforcement learning? Thank you, uppermost. Um, reinforcement learning, it looks like we're starting the 30th. Woo, day after tomorrow. Thank you for following Volcano Doc. Thank you for the host, actually. I hope the rest of your stream went well. I got really, really tired after stream last night, so I watched for a little bit. It's really, really cool. You all should give Volcano Doc a follow. Um, she's a PhD candidate studying Kilauea, right? Okay, did I say that right? Um, I've read it a bunch of times, but saying it out loud. And playing this really, really cool volcano game last night too, which was really awesome. Um, oh, I'm so glad you're interested in machine learning. This is the beauty of, of machine learning, is that it really has applicability to almost every scientific field. Oh my goodness, thank you, Ian Alex Hart, for the, for the cheer. Oh my goodness, thank you for the 300 bits. Does that mean three dog treats? Those, those, there's dogs there. So let's, let's take a small pause here and let's, let's give my dog some treats, of course. And thank you, General Soak, for following. And this will get me out of having to explain reinforcement learning ahead of time. So this is our lay of the land, really quick. And we've talked about supervised learning, right? Okay, so we're kind of ish. For now, we're done. We're done with this. And this is where we're gonna be tonight. We're gonna be talking about unsupervised learning. So that's actually a great, a great time uh, to pause and give my dogs treats, because that's what everybody wants, right? Um, I will say this, especially if you follow me on Twitter, you'll have seen this. Hubble hurt his paw this morning. Very, very upset. He sliced open the top of his back paw, so you might see him hobbling a little bit, or you might see him with some, um, with some bandages. Um, he's a very good boy, but he, he's a very uh, aggressive player. So he, he likes to jump around, leap off of things. Come on, Hubsy Bear. Let's see if we can get him to come over. He's on the couch, I see his back leg. I see you, Hubsy. Do I have to pull up the... Let me see if I can pull it up and I'll use my voice. Um, let's go, little boy. Oh, I see him looking. He's looking at it. He's debating. He's like, is it worth getting up for? Yes, it is, Hubble. It's worth getting up for, Bubsy Bear. <laughs> um, Hubble. Hubble, you want a treat? Come on, Hubs. Come on, Hubble. Good boy, Hubs. There you go. I know, his little back paw. It's this back one over here. There it is. Well, you can't even tell because his, his little paws are white. We'll give him, we'll give him a couple treats. He's a very good boy. Here you go, Hubs. You can have another because you're not feeling well. He's a very, very good boy, but he also has been licking his bandage constantly, trying to take it off if we're not watching him. 
He's a good boy, but he's he's a bit of a pain when he's not feeling well. Oh, little baby. Little baby with a little bandage. He'll feel well soon. But in any case, thank you, Ian Alex Hart, for the dog treats. We'll give him one more. Come on. Why not? And then we'll get back to our, our, our hard work of learning. Learning unsupervised learning. We're learning the learning tonight. Such a good boy. Okay. He is such a trooper doggo, exactly. It's hard to resist that face. But people are here, not for a dog stream, but for machine learning. So we'll say bye to Hubble. We'll be back if, if we get more bits and dog treats. Bye, Hubsy Bear. Hopefully he will rest, put his paws up. I had to actually give him Benadryl um, today because he is such a hyper high energy dog that he would have torn his paw open again and again. So I had to, you know, <laughs> had to had to drug him a little bit. It's only a matter of time until he just holds his mouth open in front of the treat, this treat machine. Exactly, Loaf Bone. And Volcano Doc, you say, did you set up a little robot to feed him remotely? Yes, it's called a Furbo. And then I use, um, what is it called? A uh, Blue Stacks, which is a phone emulator and or like a mobile emulator. And so that's how I pull it up for stream. It's really fun, actually. I have to resist when I'm working giving him treats though. This is just for stream, just for, just for all of you. Okay, so we've talked supervised learning. You kind of know what unsupervised learning is. I'm gonna leave reinforcement learning as a question mark for now, just to pique your interest. This is my favorite. This is, this is to me, that's where machine learning gets mind blowing. Um, but for tonight, we're gonna be talking about unsupervised learning. Okay. And so what, how does this differ besides the labels? Well, not having labels changes what we're able to accomplish. So supervised learning. What headset is it? What headset do you have? Hello, welcome, or a nod live. Um, my headset is the Bose Quiet Comfort series. I forget exactly which one. Um, 35, there you go. Low phone is on top of things tonight. The Bose Quiet Comfort 35-2 wireless Bluetooth headphones. I cannot recommend them enough. They are the most comfortable heads headset I've ever had. I use them with everything. Yes, Ornog Live, they're amazing. So they are very, very good with noise canceling, but you can toggle that. So some people have trouble where the noise canceling bothers their ears. So you can turn the noise canceling on and off, um, but they are the most comfortable like headphones I have ever, ever used. I could probably sleep with these. Um, the Kitty Slayer 7, thank you for following. How do I turn it off? Um, it's a setting, so you're able to, there might be actually be a button. I'm really bad with multitasking with my headphones. There's quite a few buttons on the side that you can use, so it's probably a button, honestly. I just turn it off via the app in my phone. Um, okay, so unsupervised learning, right? Like we've said, oopsies, let's not use that. That's our, that's our header color. We don't wanna do that, all right. We don't have labels. So we're lacking our dependent variable here. So instead, instead of making a prediction about a relationship between X and Y, we're gonna be looking for patterns within our data. And this is the interesting thing is that I'm giving away a little bit, a little bit of maybe what I was going to talk about at the end, but as a slight preview, remember, remember the lesson that we learned with ensembling, which is, you know, when, when I think we started out when we did our linear regression, we did our lo logistic regression and our decision trees and whatnot, there was kind of this sensation of like, okay, here's, here's the, here's the, you know, data science process, the machine learning development process, you have your data you clean it, you prep it, you look at it, then you pick a model, you apply the model to the data and voila, you get your answers. Well, it can be a little bit more complicated than that. <laughs> Spoiler, it's a lot more complicated. Uh, thank you for following Winston Yellow. I'm gonna say yellow. Um, you can actually, not only can you do ensembles of models where they're all running concurrently, but you can also use them kind of uh, consecutively. 
And so I've actually used unsupervised learning methods on supervised learning data sets to explore patterns within the data. So you can include things like the clustering techniques we'll be talking about tonight as a method for pre-processing your data and discovering more relationships within it. So that's something, uh, something to, to keep in mind, right? Remember, remember the lesson of ensembling. Our machine learning models often do better when we use them together. New original, all of this to get better at Dota. <sighs> I wish. I'm the worst Dota player, so. <laughs> I, I'm not getting better at, at Dota no matter how many machine learning models I apply to it. <laughs> okay. So, so yes, um, can be used as part of your EDA, your exploratory data analysis. Um... So the, the type of machine learning, the type of, blah, 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 the type of unsupervised learning that we're going to be talking about tonight is part of a broad family of models called clustering. Okay. And what happens, what happens with, with clustering? So in this case, remember I just said we're trying to find, actually I can link these. <laughs> Looking for patterns within the data. All right. So... In this case, the pattern that we're looking for is natural grouping. Is my head in the way now? Natural, natural grouping in our data. And what does that mean? What is a cluster? Um, a cluster, you can think of it in a couple of different ways. Um, so you can think about it visually. So let's say that we had two features. In this case, I'm going to avoid using X and Y because that kind of, that gives you a feeling like it's, um, we have that dependent, independent variable relationship. So let's just say this is feature one and feature two. And so maybe, this would be a wonderful data set for clustering. So you can think about your um, natural grouping is what new strangers seem all. <laughs> new original. Are you going to just make Dota metaphors for, for all of the machine learning? I'm not complaining <laughs> at all. All right. So each of these we would say is a cluster. So this would be a case where we have three clusters. And they're kind of uniform. They're kind of circular in shape, right? And they have a really nice division here. And so if you remember, this might remind you of the Voronoi diagrams that we did last time a little bit, but we could say like, you know, this might be where we would define our clusters. Anything within this space would be part of these three clusters. And so that's one way that you can define a cluster. Um, why is the purple one so, th so thick? All right. So we can define a cluster in this case, in, in this case <laughs> as an area of density in our feature space. And so there's, you know what, this is a great, a great moment to pause for a second because there are a lot of terms that people throw around when talking about, when talking about decision, or when talking about machine learning, goodness, sorry. I'm not over this cold yet, so I apologize if I seem a little flustered. Um, just gonna keep chugging the tea. So there, there are a lot of terms that I see thrown around that can be very intimidating to folks who are kind of new to machine learning or just, you know, they, they sound fancier than they are, really. So feature space is one of them. Um, Alan Rodriguez Developer, thank you for following. So area of density, what is what is what are what do these words actually mean? Okay? So let's translate this, because remember this is this is my favorite thing, and this isn't just because I'm I used to be a linguist. I love to translate the complicated stuff and make it simple. So let's do that with this with this definition. A cluster is an area of density in our feature space. So let's start with feature space. What is a feature space? So all of these graphs that we've been making so far. So far, we've been sticking with two-dimensional because I am not very gifted when it comes to drawing. Um, 
A feature space is a space defined by features. That's it, so maybe, let's, let's be more specific here. Instead of feature one and feature two, let's actually, let's, let's, let's come up with some features. So, now I gotta figure out the spot. Um, so let's say that this is, um, the, I've got to think of things that are like not necessarily related. It's easy to come up with like a linear relationship between variables, but um, let's say that this is, um, oh, here, this will be for new original. So when playing, when playing a video game, maybe this is going to be the, um, the difficulty, the difficulty um, of the game. I'll have this little sparkly pen. And maybe this is gonna be um, the age, the age of the player. And you might think that they're related. That's fine, I'm trying to come up with some off the top of my head, so bear with me. All right, so these might not, instead of representing um, relationships between the age of the player and the difficulty of the game, these might actually rem represent games. These clusters might represent, or genres of games that might be more difficult, but young players seem to like it. Or um, really young players that like easy, easier games, and this might be a cluster of a genre of game that's middling difficulty, but older people like them. Who knows? In any case, we would have way more than, than three clusters. This is your feature space. It is a space defined by your features. That is it, okay? The difficulty becomes that, you know, as human beings, most of us are, are, are rather visual. It's not a rule, but we do like to see things plotted out. You know, that's why data visualization is a really, really prominent career. The problem is, is that the vast majority of the time when you're working with data, you're not working in a two-dimensional space. Two-dimensional because we have two variables, okay? We're going to be working in spaces where we have 50 variables, where we have 50 different features. Because maybe it's not just the age of the player and the difficulty of the video game, maybe it's when the game came out, what console it's for, um, the genre of the game, the, um, you know, the, uh, how many hours you need to complete the game, um, the curse of dimensionality, exactly, and that's it, just as good, Joe, thank you for bringing that up. Because that's something we've talked about in previous streams. Um, off droid, thank you for following. But the curse of dimensionality, I, I, I like to think is more than just how dimensionality messes with our models. It's also about how difficult it becomes to communicate about our models and to visualize them when we have lots of dimensions, lots of variables, lots of features. That's all that means. Um, le few, thank you for following. Okay, so we know what feature space is, right? This kind of makes sense. It's just a space defined by our features, whether there's two features, three features, or 50 features. It's just that, that space that if we were to plot them all and try to not think about a 50 dimensional plot, I keep trying, like you'll see me sometimes like maybe like kind of squinting and looking up because no matter how many times I tell myself I can't do it, I try every time. <laughs> you can't visualize it. Alas, the curse of living in a three dimensional world. Um, however, that's, that's, that's all that this, this, this feature space means, is it means if we were to talk about the plot made from all of those features, that space that the plot would describe, that's our feature space. So you're gonna hear people using this term so frequently to talk about distributions within our feature space. You're just talking about the spread of your data, but we have to, we have to say it fancy because we all need to feel smart, I guess. Um, and collided scope, you say how to determine how many means is sufficiently many. I'm guessing you mean the K, right? We'll talk about how to figure out the K value. So do not worry and we'll build one ourselves. So we'll, we'll get there. How many clusters, right? Okay, so then our next term that we need to figure out is density. Density is just how close everything is. And those of you who were here for the K nearest neighbor stream, little, little bells should be going off in your head right now. Right, because we've talked about density, closeness, distance in our previous stream, and we defined it. We used, we used our Euclidean distance, another fancy word to just mean Pythagorean theorem. Zero Pierre, zero, thank you for following. 
So that's all we're talking about. And there, there are different ways to define this mathematically, but you can think about how close the data points are from, from one another. That's all density means. So an area of density just means a place where it's all clumped up together in the, the, the you know, graph that we would make by plotting all of our features. And that's what this is. That's, that's us translating this, um, this into some, some practical English. And new original, you ask, is K subjective? No. And I will show you why. Um, and really, I think this, this, this gets back to a, a scientific endeavor that is in every single scientific field, which is grouping your data. We have done this since the dawn of time, which is you see things that look similar, you group them. It's how we define cats versus dogs. It's how we define, you know, trees versus stones. You group things that look similar, that have similar properties. One of the terms that we're going to need though, do I have enough colors? I never have enough colors. Let's use, ooh, yellow. I need like a bigger bar because I don't want the highlighter. Okay, maybe I could do this on my own time. Um, <laughs> I, want, I want all the colors. All right. One of the terms that we're going to need to use today is centroid, which is just the center of the cluster. Okay. center of the cluster. Okay, and so that's 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 a term that we're going to be needing. Um, we also have these boundaries. We've already talked about that. We've talked about decision space, what a cluster is. You came for cute cats. I have cute dogs, Miss Mrs. Q. I do I do have cute dogs. Um, unfortunately, there are no cats. Um, I love cats, though. I miss my cats. Um, I had two cats. Uh, one of my dogs is a rescue dog, though, and he would murder cats, so I can't get any new cats for a while. It's okay. We love Tennessee. He's a good boy. He sings to us at the end of stream. Slight spoiler alert if any of you are sci-fi fans. Um, my dog, Tennessee, wraps up stream by singing for us. You can get a little preview of his vocal talent there. Um, okay. So, like I said... We have different ways to measure density, and we're going to be clustering things based on behavior, based on features, based on characteristics. Now, this at this point, you probably are, most of you who have been here for a few streams are going to roll your eyes and go, yes, I know, you've told us this a million times. What step, because we are dealing with distance, that's your clue here, what step in our data pre-processing is going to be non-negotiable? It's always non-negotiable, but it's extra non-negotiable now. Um. Oh, thank you for hosting the original. And yes, MC Childs coming in with the correct answer, as expected. Um, scaling the data. Exactly. This is non-negotiable, my friends. Scale your damn data. Uh, Red Hacken, thank you for following as well. We are dealing with distance. So that means that, you know, let's say I have a data set, ooh, I don't know, like the data set we're gonna be using today that has year as one of the features. Well, it doesn't matter if, you know, I don't know, let's let's think about our, our back to our video game, right? If our date of release of our video game is 2020, that is not somehow like more valuable or greater in value than the 30 hours that the game, maybe you need to, to, that's the average time to beat the game. Let's say that's our other feature. The problem is, is you have to think about this in terms of like the meaning of the number. I know this is gonna get a little meta for a second, so bear with me. This is why scaling and no or normalizing your data is really, really important. This is also why when you do feature selection and you do your one hot encoding that we've done before, this is really, really critical. You have to think about what am I telling the model? 2020 is a much bigger integer than 30. Massively bigger. Am I telling my model in some way that 2020 is somehow this much, much, much greater value? Like that feature has a much, much higher value. No, that's not what I'm saying. It's got a different range. Like maybe, I don't know when the earliest video game came out, but like, you know, video games have been around for at the very least 40 years. And if there's a 40 integer range there, 
and there's a 40 integer range there isn't but let's say the shortest game would take five hours to beat the longest game like i don't know 100 hours totally pulling these numbers out of a hat just you know, we need to normalize the data so that they have the same range even if the numbers themselves are different otherwise you know a game that's made in 1980 versus 2020 is going to have a much 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 greater distance than a game that takes 30 hours to beat versus a game that takes five and that might not actually be true in terms of the the conceptual distance between those games there might actually be more similarity between a 30 hour to beat 1980s game and a 30 hour to beat 2020s game versus you know a five hour to beat 2020 game and a 30 hour to beat 2020 game so i'm i'm, I'm hand waving a little bit but I hope that you see that the second that you in your head, if you're reading about some new fancy model, right, that comes out tomorrow, I don't know, Google comes out with some new fancy thing, and you're reading it, and you're like, yeah, I wanna, you know, I'm gonna implement this model because I'm a data scientist, and you sit down and you read it and you realize that distance is a key metric, that should trigger in your head, I need to normalize, you should always normalize your data, but that should extra, 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 extra trigger in your head that you need to normalize your data. Uh, thank you, Disk Dino. For, for, for following. But I'm glad also thank you to those in chat who answered correctly because also just as good Joe hopped in there with the correct answer as well. Um, Gabrielle GZ, thank you for following. Um, okay. So I'm gonna also, I'm gonna clarify here. We're talking distance and or similarity. And we'll measure these things differently based on what kind of clustering we're using. GR Thomps, thank you for following. Okay. And what this result results in, ideally, right, is clusters that are meaningful, they're useful for us. So if we can come up with some ideas, not just my weird pulling this out of my hat video game example, right? Perhaps we want to um, cluster customers based on buying patterns to make groups of customers so that we can tailor our products or our advertising for them. Maybe we are doing medical trials, say for vaccines, for communicable diseases, and we wanna cluster trial patients based on their responses to the drugs. This allows us to group massive data sets into meaningful and useful subgroups that we can then use to see patterns in our data. Okay. There are many different kinds of clustering algorithms, all right? So we're gonna talk about a couple different kinds tonight. Um, gotta scroll through my notes. Let's make this big, I want all the room. Okay. Is that more treats? Let's see if we can get, is Hubble, is Hubble back on the couch? He's back on the couch, maybe. Let's see if we can give him some treats. Thank you for the bits, Ian Alex Hart. So this is a good, well, we'll take a brief break here to see if we can get Hubble to come by. And, oh, yep, there he is. Good boy, Hubs. Did you hear the noise? Come here, Hubble. Oh, why is his tail down? So I, I'll tell you a, a tiny, we'll, we'll have a tiny story time about dogs, about Border Collies, which Hubble is part Border Collie, which is that, oh, he does not want treats. Hubble, Ras Math, thank you for following, um, which is that the desirable Border Collie is the Border Collie that keeps his tail the way Hubble's tail is, well, just was, which is down. And the tail that you saw swoop up, that little hook shape, um, is how, let's see if I can get him to come over. We'll try, we'll try one more treat. Come on, Bubsy Bear. No, he might be a little bit tired. I'm so sorry. He does have an injured paw tonight, so he might not be in the mood for treats. Poor little bean. Um, but, that tail that's up like that tends to be in border collies, I guess, that are not focused or are very playful and energetic and, and don't do their work. Um, so those are less desirable for, for kind of focused farm work. Um, and I discovered that when learning more about his breed. I thought that was really funny is like the tail down, which I associate with Hubble being sad. If Hubble's sad and he's not getting his way, his tail drops. Um, but if his tail's super up like that, his happiest is where the tail's actually like coming in and touching his back. Um, I associate that with a happy Hubble. So my parents actually, so my, my, my dad is Russian, Ukrainian. And, um, 
He he calls it. He used to call Hubble a kula, which is the Russian word for uh, shark, because when Hubble's like pacing by the dinner table, all you see is the is the is the tail going back and forth like this. <laughs> so we call it the uh, akula tail. So happy happy Hubble tail. Um, Disc Dino, say you're new to the channel. Do you use Spark or other stream-based ETLs for data parsing? I have. I've used PySpark, so the Python wrapper for Spark, for Apache Spark. Um, I have. I haven't used them in stream. I usually use them for work, um, but for uh, for um, for stream, I tend to use simpler data sets so that we can really focus on the structure of the models. Um, and Goofy Lagrangian, is there any ML work on learning dog mood based on their features, ears, tails, paws? I don't know, you'll have to ask Lofone. He's our resident vet tech, so he would probably know. Um, it'd be really cool to, to, maybe we should do that. We would need a good data set, but that would be really, really cool to kind of see if there's a way to take images of dogs and like predict mood based on the images. Um, so to answer a few questions from chat before we move on to different kinds of clustering, Strawberry Jesus, you say you're Russian Ukrainian too. Oh, oh, friend. Okay, here. There's a Wikipedia page based on my my great 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 so several many greats uncle. Um, so Strawberry Jesus, Google um, or here I'll just I'll, I'll post the link. Hold on. There's a town in Ukraine named after my family um, because. This is my great, 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 great uncle. It makes me very sad that it's good. It says Gerbianka because like we, the, my maiden name is Herbinka. So, um, Hrebyanka in the, in, in Ukrainian. Which has also been like, since I got divorced, has been like a weird needle in my side is that I need to like change my name back. But I've built my entire career using my married name. So it's like, Anyway, um, Winston Yellow, you say you use PySpark at work too. Yeah, it's great. I've had good luck with PySpark. Anomaly102, you ask, are you trying to learn ML in 12 days or are you just doing 12 days of machine learning? So this is an educational stream. Um, I am a, like a lead machine learning developer, so I've done lots and lots of machine learning. So I still have lots to learn, um, but I'm not trying to learn machine learning in 12 days. I'm trying to help you all learn machine learning in 12 days and dump a bunch of stuff in my rusty brain at all of you and hope that it sticks. Um, and MacGyver, you ask, is TensorFlow the best open source ML library? It is one of many. Um, it is a great one. Um, I think it really, really depends on, it depends on the, you know, the stack that you're using. It depends on your data. It depends on the models that you're using. Um, <laughs> let's see, Avian uh, and, Oh no, Matt Childs, hold on. A A Akulichka, Akulichka? Oh yes, Akulichka, yes, all right. My Russian is very slow now. Yani panimayu poruski, unfortunately anymore. Or I guess, usually I say ya panimayu chuchut poruski because I'm trying to be a little bit brave, but really it's it's rough, it's a rough situation. Um, And avian const constabulary, so you should register the last name with SAG, you know, if you're out for blood, then you get to use both. I don't even know what that would involve. Isn't SAG like acting? In any case, the Screen Actors Guild. Yeah, I was in a TV show once that shall not be named, but in any case, um, choo choo, exactly. I love that, that's like one of my favorite adjectives. Um, <laughs> it's like similar kind of thing in, in Arabic shwaya, and I just, I, I love that. It's just like, just a little bit, a little bit. Um, I know, I, I wish, I wish Screen Actors Guild was for, for, for streamers, that would be cool. Okay, so we're gonna talk about three main types of clustering tonight. So clustering. Clustering types. Should have put types of clustering, but I am lazy and I'm not gonna rewrite it. Also, isn't this so pretty? You can see all the stars. I, I love this pen. I keep it really thick. Yes, thick with two Cs because I love to be able to see all the stars. All right. So our first type of clustering that we're gonna talk about is hierarchical. I hate that word. Hierarchical. There's just too many liquids. I don't know. Hierarchical clustering. Hi, Mindalator. Welcome. Okay, so hierarchical, 
Hierarchy clustering. I hate that word. <laughs> Uh, Til Tillman does not code. Thank you for following. All right, so there's, you'll either have a bottoms up or a tops down approach here with hierarchical clustering. You can either start from the top or the bottom. And you'll get this cool, cool tree looking thing called apparently, I Googled this, a dendrogram. Let me get you a picture. This is, this is dendro, excuse me, dendrogram. You know, T-I-L. Um which is a, a diagram representing a tree. Look, look, look at that. Look at the first example, hierarchical class. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you good, good stuff here. I always think of the tree of life, right? So you will get a, you will get a, an approach that is like this. So we might either start with all of the examples and work upwards, or we start with our root and we propagate downwards. And that should feel kind of intuitive a little bit from, um, from our work with decision trees as well. Dendro is tree, is that, well, arbor is tree in Latin, so I'm guessing dendro is tree in Greek. Um, okay, um, a couple of notes here. You do have to specify the number of clusters. And I'm going to show you an, uh, you know, an approach there to figure out how many clusters you should use, but it is something to note. Like it's great when the machine figures out some of these parameters for us in higher hierarchical clustering, dendromatic clustering. Um, we have to specify the number of clusters. There are some, there are some positives though. So, so if we're to make our little T chart here, our pros versus our cons of this model. Our pros are that it's highly interpretable and explainable, right? Just like with decision trees, whenever we're able to visualize the machine's decision-making process, it makes it interpretable and explainable, which is really great. Downsides, this one is a bit computationally expensive. Computationally, it's hard to talk and write computationally expensive, and unfortunately it's quite sensitive to um, noise in your data, to anomalies. Um, Hassan Ashkar, thank you for following. All right, so the two types, like I just mentioned, of, of hierarchical clustering, right? We have our, this is 1A right, would be um, our top down. This is uh, top down, so this is called divisive. I've seen this called divisive clustering. Is that, I'll move this for you. There we go. And I always think of like somebody that's very argumentative and causing problems when I see divisive, but it's, it's you can think about it like top down, this is the clustering that divides, okay? So this is where we start out with all of our points. All of our data points are gonna be in one cluster to start. All right, and then from there, what we're gonna do is we're gonna split iteratively. Iteratively split clusters. Um, oopsies. We're gonna iteratively split the least similar clusters. You might think about that as our least dense clusters until only single data points remain. That's our top-down approach. Um, what tool am I using to draw? I think this is just Microsoft White, yeah, Microsoft, Microsoft Whiteboard. Um, it works, it's all right. Um, okay, so this is a lot, not a lot, but it, you can think about it like our decision tree. We start with our root node, we start with one cluster and we split based on a rule of some kind. Unlike decision trees, we also have what we'll call our, our bottom up. So he keeps saying bottoms up as if we're drinking. Bottom up. And another tough word, I've seen this, our agglomerative, 
Again, we're just feeling fancy here. Agglomerative clustering, which literally just means we're smushing stuff together. This is the smushing method. Smushing. There you go. Combining. Bottom up, are we talking about quarks? Not today, non-dairy neutrino. We will get back to Science Sunday streams after the 12 days of machine learning miss. Um, and maybe we can talk about quarks then. Um, so what this does is instead of having all of your data points start in one cluster, you're going to have just the wide field of your data. And you're going to start to combine the most similar data points. Thank you for following, Robbie Craft. And you iteratively continue the combinations until you have a single cluster. Or you reach your K, right? Like you're gonna reach your number of clusters. So actually let's let's be more specific. You can keep going until you have a single cluster. I don't recommend that. So instead, let's say until you have your desired number of clusters. We'll phrase it like that. I think that's clear. Um, three even, thank you for following. Okay, so these are our two kinds of hierarchical, so ready to be done with that word, uh, clustering. So this is where we are creating our clusters hierarchically. We are starting from the top, we're starting from the bottom, and we're iterating through a dendromatic diagram, a dendro, what were they called again? A de dendrogram. Sure. Okay. Let's keep going. The other kind of clustering, or our second kind of clustering here. Um, does it, let's see, uh, there are some questions. One sec. And thank you, Azodio, for following. So MC Childs, you say, does the same go for top down? You stop at the specified K or go all the way to single data points. So with hierarchical clustering, let me, let me make that a lot clearer. Yeah. I think... What I should specify is, let's say, let's say I have a really small data set. Let's say I have a data set of 50 points, and for some reason I'm not very smart, and I pick 5,000 clusters. <clears throat> this is the stopping condition. So, if, if it converges, if you get your desired number of clusters first, great, it'll stop. However, if it doesn't reach the desired number of clusters, this is the stopping condition if that makes sense. Same with the iteratively continue until you have your desired number of clusters or it's all one cluster. So the kind of fail safe, if you will, so it just doesn't keep trying to move data points around infinitely is in this case until only a single data points remain or until you have a single cluster, unless it hits your specified K first. Hopefully that makes sense. And then just as good Joe, you ask, is there stochastic Stoch another word. Stochasticity to this. You run a bunch of times, do you get data points in different clusters? If so, can you quantify uncertainty? So I should have specified this earlier. These are non-deterministic models. So, well, hierarchical clustering is non-deterministic. And so that means that when we repeat this process, even if we have the same K, the same number of specified clusters, we can get different, no, wait, hold on. I just goofed that. This is this is deterministic. This is the one kind of deterministic clustering. Most clustering is non-deterministic. I've actually never done hierarchical clustering um, myself. But um, the computationally expensive part of this makes it to me less, less worth it. I'm sure there are cases where this is very successful. Um, I believe if I'm remembering correctly, this is the one deterministic kind. The other kinds that we'll be talking about are non-deterministic. Let me make sure that I had that right and I didn't just swap it. Um, partitional is the next part and that is non-deterministic. Um, hierarchical clustering is deterministic. I remembered it correctly. Go me. Okay. So just as good, Joe, most clustering is non-deterministic. So there is we have to worry about the fact that if we repeat this, even with the same like random seed and everything, we're going to get different results. Um, 
And yes, MC Childs, we do have a built-in way to avoid the infinite loop. And that is the conditions that we just talked about. Um, and Albert, Alberto Foxy, 1991. Um, yes, you can ask, you can ask questions. Please do. Um, okay. So, actually, while people are asking questions, I'm going to take a quick swig of tea here. How many words per minute can you type? Are you a fast typer? Um, the last time I tested myself, which wasn't on this keyboard, uh, it was about 120 words per minute. So I can type reasonably fast. I don't often type that fast because usually I'm thinking more than I'm typing. Um, oh my goodness. Thank you for the raid. Rockstar74, thank you for following. Frozen Walkway, thank you for following. And thank you for the raid. Dan said, I have to give you mod. I do not know who Dan is, but I'm sorry, Dan. We have one lone mod. It's like the, the Lone Ranger, and that is Loaf Foam. Um, poor singular mod handling all these bigger streams now. We're, we're usually a small stream, but these machine learning streams have been a little bit, little bit bigger than usual. Um, Siddhartha2862, thank you for following. Um, I did not say that, but I am Dan. Well, hi, Dan. Welcome. Let's give Dan a shout out. Rockstar, what kind of stream did you have? <laughs> Hopefully you all had a fun stream. Today we are working with unsupervised learning in our 12 days of machine learning. Um, here's the schedule. So we have finished up our, uh, used to start up today looking at better analytics. Ooh, nice. Well, we are doing the 12 days of machine learning. So I'm covering 12 different areas, applications, or types of models in machine learning. I originally was to do them all consecutively, and then I just realized I was getting way too tired. So <laughs> they're spread out a little bit. Um, Oh, cool. What was your research on Rockstar, Dan? Um, you said a huge fan of ML. You used to do some research way back in college. It's very cool. I did not do ML in college. I did linguistics. Actually, the the funny thing is, um, and this, this might have been like, you know, a little glimpse of my future, is that my senior year, I tried to come up with what was machine learning, but I didn't have the words to describe it. And I was looking for a computer science major who would do a like a collaborative thesis project with me, um, doing predictive translations that would like identify like uh, regional dialect boundaries based on the speaker's like syntax and and grammar and everything. Um, and I couldn't find a computer science student willing to work with. So maybe that was just, I was, I was thinking ahead to applying cool, cool models to language. Um, detecting stuff off of an EKG. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Risky banana. Hi, risky banana. Um, and Alberto Foxy, I'm not going to do a speed test game right now. We are in the middle of, of, of learning about machine learning, but, but, uh, maybe, maybe another time. Oh yeah. Thank you so much for stopping by. Um, hope, hope you have a good rest of your day whatever time it is where you are. Um, and Risky Banana, his paw's doing okay. I've bandaged it twice now. We're keeping Neosporin on it. Quick stop to keep the bleeding down. He's, he's a good boy though. He's mostly mostly sleeping. The problem with him is that he has literally sliced his, his leg open before and just wanted to keep playing and keep playing and keep playing and keep playing. This is a dog who got neutered and like the day after was like, no, literally I was picking him up from the vet and was trying to like jump around in the back seat and be like, I see another dog, can we play, can we play? So he's an unstoppable force. Uh, Kodoko, thank you for following, which is part of the challenge. In any case, our second kind of clustering that we're gonna talk about tonight is called density-based clustering. Density-based clustering. Um, these headphones are awesome, non-dairy neutrino. They are my favorite headphones. I would recommend them to every single person, honestly. I, I love them. Okay. And so, this is where we are determining our, we're gonna call this cluster assignment, right? Membership into a cluster. Which cluster you belong to, which group you belong to. Our cluster assignment here is based on density.
And what do I mean by density? This gets to our clusters here are going to be defined as areas of high density surrounded by areas of low density. What drawing tablet amazing? It's an XP pen one of some kind. Um, community detection, that's an interesting question. So all of these different clustering approaches are ways of tackling the problem of how do we group data? How do we group it in a way that's intelligent and meaningful and useful? When you say community detection, I worry that you might be getting more into like social network analysis, which you can use clustering for, but usually you're using more of the network analysis kind of approaches um, and like the graph analytic approaches, but we have a whole stream on that coming up. So don't worry if that's kind of what you're interested in. Um, that is one of the one of the topics for, for the 12 days of machine learning. Okay, um, let's see here, scroll down on my notes, okay. Um, yay, thank you for the cheers, Ian Alex Hart. Let's see, I'm gonna just peek over at Hubble. He is passed out, actually. Can we, can we reward, since, since Hubble is resting, can we get some amazing pictures of Hubble in the chat, Loaf Bone, as a reward, since he probably is not gonna want treats right now? I'm sorry, we did, we, we had to give him some Benadryl. So he's, he's sleeping. He's a little bit drugged up. Poor Bean. We love our Hubble. All right. Um, thank you, thank you, Loafbum. Okay. And I scrolled past my notes. This is not very smart, Jess. All right. There we go. Beautiful, beautiful thing about density-based clustering. Density-based clustering, guess what? You don't need to specify the number of clusters. So that is a perk to density-based clustering. That is wonderful. We don't have to go in knowing how many clusters to use. Uh, and a quick question from chat. David Ames, you say, hey, how do you get motivated to do productive things, to learn tough subjects, and to be successful? I feel like this is also an excellent question for MC Childs in chat because he has just has this like more so than me he's like me times a thousand when it comes to just like this amazing like undeterred voracious appetite for learning in my case i don't know if it's adhd or if it's just my own personality but i get bothered when i don't understand something and so the best way I can describe this is through through an example of talking to one of my friends and he asked me, um, well, how do you know all these medical terms? Uh, a, W, Z, one, two, three, thank you for following. And besides, this was before EMT school. And I mean, apart from growing up, going to hospitals a lot with my younger brother, she's like, well, every time I'm watching a medical show and they use a word I don't understand, I look it up and I read like the entire Wikipedia article on it. And if I'm reading that Wikipedia article and there's another word I don't know, I click the link for that and I read that article and iteratively and iteratively, which means that I've gone down some really strange rabbit holes. Um, one of the summers in college while I was working as a rare books archivist, uh, I probably read everything there was to read about bog bodies because they just deeply fascinated me and I went down one of those Wikipedia rabbit holes. Um, but I think... For me, it's just that chat, like, I'm, if I don't know something and you know it, I want to talk to you. If there's an article about something I don't understand, I want to read it. If it's written poorly, I'm going to close the article and find a different one. So I'm not saying that I'm great. Like, I sometimes struggle with the really, really dense articles because I find them written poorly. I think that there's no reason for academic articles to be full of unnecessary jargon. Sometimes jargon's necessary, but you should define it if you're going to use it. Uh, night 7R, thank you for following. Um, there's no reason that we can't have academic articles about even the most comp- Like, I've done streams. No, not even streams. I have taught astrophysics and metaphysics to fifth graders. Conceptually. Like, I'm not asking them to do the math. They're not there yet. 
conceptually speaking, you can simplify things and have them understand it like you can. And I don't mean simplify as in water down. I mean, don't use jargon. Like that's actually my area of focus is science communication to kids because it's, it's a lot, that is the, that is the ultimate challenge. Take your complicated field, now explain it to an eight year old and keep their interest without watering down what you're doing. That is the greatest challenge there is. And so that was a slight aside, sorry, slight, so I guess that this is pretty much a soapbox. So uh, I gotta keep myself accountable here. Um, but really, I think it comes down to just a desire to constantly fill in the unknown. It's like fog of war in a video game. If there's a dark area in my mind, if there's something I don't understand, I am just compulsively motivated to figure it out. It really, really helps um, to work with interesting data and to work on, on projects you find interesting. And that's the biggest thing is like, and that's one reason that school sometimes I would honestly skip all of the lectures in, in college and I would read the textbook or teach myself is that I wanted to follow my own areas of interest. And so that can be, it can be a challenge and it can make work sometimes hard too. But when you're, when you're teaching yourself, follow whatever it is that interests you. If there's a, a field, if there's a data type, if there's a machine learning model, I'm obviously biased using examples from stream, but if there is a topic that you find interesting, follow that for as long as it interests you. Um, and let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. You say, David Ames, you say, I soak up information like a sponge, but I've never been good at school and doing the work or reliable occupation-wise either. I don't know what occupation-wise reliability looks like. I can say that the longest I've ever had a job is two and a half years, and that's the job I'm at now. Or not even two years, exactly. Um, I change careers every couple of years. So I'm right there with you. Um, and Shrumpf, Shrumpf Muff, <laughs> what a hard name. Um, you say you're an ML engineer too, awesome. Welcome. Um, let's see, do, 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 do. Yeah, so MC Childs, you say, honestly, same, not understanding something is annoying, so just minimizing annoyance is part of it. Exactly. I wouldn't say I underachieved in college. Um, but if my, if my story can be a cautionary tale, I guess. I performed very poorly in, uh, I will say this, I performed less well in public school. Um, and my parents pulled me out of public school and used their college savings to put me in a private school where there were five other people in my class. And I was able to focus a lot better. And I had teachers that were willing to like work with me. So like we had one um, girl in my class, thank you, Bygra, for following, who had a lot of test anxiety. So the teachers let her take the test as a conversation, like talking to the teacher through each of the problems. So if you had a learning disability or you had any kind of struggles, I feel like in some ways it was a lot more helpful because you had that one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, but uh, that was probably for me a lot of my undiagnosed ADHD. But working in those small classes, being challenged, and this was the beauty, and I think more schools should do this, is I went from public school where I'd be given 50, 60 boring math problems a night and I hated math. Went to this private school where I got three problems a night, but each one would take me an hour. And I blossomed. I loved it. I loved the challenge. My favorite thing was math proofs because I wanted to sit there and wrestle with it and figure it out. And I would just sit in my room for hours doing math, which to me is still, still a blast. Um, but also because it wasn't just worksheets and busy work. Like my teachers respected me enough to challenge me. And I, I realized that that's not every school. It also meant when I got to college, I struggled at first because college was easier than high school. And I didn't understand these giant classes of boring lectures. Um, but to finish answering your question, I didn't underachieve in college. I underachieved maybe by my own standards. Um, I guess, if anything, the underachievement I have done in my life is I, I, I struggle to stick with something. I'm constantly fascinated by the things I don't know. 
So if you're hiring me to do the same thing over and over and over again, I won't do well. If you're hiring me for a job where I'm required to innovate and discover new things and try to find new ways to solve problems or to solve new problems, I'm happy forever. And my current job does allow me to do that. And that's what I really, really like. Um, let's see. Uh, is Brick, do you take suggestions for future topics? So the topics for the 12 days of machine learning are finalized, um, but if you have topics for future streams, there is a redeemable thing in chat um, for science topics, or if you're just like, hey, I'd love if you would do a stream sometime on this, I will add it to my, my queue. The way to ensure, like if you're 100% you want me to talk about something is the redemption thing. Um, and War Control, you say you're new here, you need a good pricey GPU for machine learning. Um, I'm sorry, my friend, I can't help you. The machine learning GPUs I've been able to use are bought by the company and therefore extremely expensive. Um, I don't do, I don't need pricey GPUs for my home machine learning projects. Um, if you're doing home projects, you don't need it. If you're doing them for work, your work should buy it. And oh my goodness, just, just do Elia Skarell. Thank you. This is actually props to my mom. This, this turtleneck was a gift from her, so. Um, and you say, is that what got you into linguistics, you think? Actually, what got me, and I, I've talked about this plenty. There's actually talks I've given, and I've been on podcasts talking about this, but um, I entered college pre-med. Well, actually, I started, I left high school wanting to be a math major. Had a really, a bad run-in with a teacher that was like, you're bad at math. And after years of getting math awards, you think I would be, like, impervious to it. But I have a thin skin. I don't do well, honestly. Like, people say, I, I wish I had a thicker skin, but I don't, even now. And I went, wow, I must be bad at math. Okay, believed the teacher. Uh, went pre-med. My first pre-med, uh, my first bio class was, like, 600 students. And I was like... <laughs> Nope, can't do that. I'm used to having five people in my, <laughs> my classes. So I went, shit, what else do I like? I love language and my dad's a linguist. So I looked up the linguistics department where I was at school. It was tiny and I went, hell yes. And I just dived in. So I still love linguistics. I miss it. I wish, I, but you know what? It's really hard to get paid to speak languages and to translate things without a political or militaristic motive behind it. Um, my dream in college was to be an Arabic poetry translator. And unfortunately, there's just not a big enough market demand for that. So, uh, Sunless Night, thank you for following. Um, and let's see, say, so remind you of Chomsky. <laughs> I, I, I will take that as a compliment, even if universal grammar is bullshit. Um, how to get a job which allows you to do that, like constantly innovate. See, that's the, that's, that's the difficult thing, Strawberry Jesus. And I'll wrap this tangent up so we can get back to the clustering. But I do think the constant innovation has more to do with what team you're on in a lot of jobs. So for me, I work in consulting, which can be mind-numbingly boring business ease, right? Like just, ugh. But I, I'm lucky enough to work in a smaller subdivision of a team of a division kind of thing where I rotate off projects every couple of months which is really really nice I mean I do I do like four to six months sprints on a project build software roll off and go build something else um oh my goodness okay so thank you uh, Ian Alex Hart thank you you're like this like wonderful steady omnipresent sub gifter thank you and anonymous cheer, thank you so much for the bits and welcome. Um, and uh, Casa Casa do Conjios, married with kids. Yeah, I remember. Um, I'm probably pronouncing this. I don't know where the accent should be, like the emphasis on Casado. Is it Casado? Is it Casado? Is it Casado? Help me out here. Conjios, I think I've got decently. But um, what is the average number of students in a public school classroom in the states? In the DC metro area, it's about 30. Um, and often you have multiple classes of those 30. If you, if you're teaching, like if you're a math teacher, like my mom, she'll have like three or four classes of 30 students that rotate in throughout the day. Um, okay. I do Einstein. It is, it is indeed one of those and it is big and it's honking and it's pricey AF and it's a beauty. Oh, it's, it's just, whew. All right. Okay, 
trying to catch up on chat so we can also get back to density-based clustering, which is what we're trying to be doing here. Um, do, 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 do. I do like the Arabic language war control. I majored in North African linguistics in college, so French and Arabic. Um, I miss it desperately. Linguistics department, I know the Arabic department, like, do you, we got to talk about this someday, uh, MC Childs, but like, did I ever tell you what happened to the Arabic department? I have no idea. I have no idea what happened. Big money and consulting depends on the company. Though I am grateful for my company. I was able to renegotiate my salary this year and they gave me a raise at the end of the year for a lot of my work. Um, I would say it's still probably lower than a lot of like competitive tech company salaries, but uh, my company went above and beyond for people during the pandemic. They froze all, all firing for like six months. They made all these funds to help employees. They put us all on telework. We get free COVID tests, all kinds of stuff. So I am grateful for that. Um, Sandstrom81, thank you for following. Let's see, Scrumpfmuff. You say, I'm building object detection models in order to detect birds on cars and drone footage. Oh, that's really cool. I've worked with, with um, a lot of the stuff I'm, I'm working with now is more computer vision, um, but I do not get to control the sensors, so. And you say, it's Rick, you say, I would love stream series on data cleaning, set up a utils, what are the golden patterns you've learned? It's showing them in action. Oh, it's Rick. Where have you been, friend? I have done so many streams at this point on exploratory data analysis, and people were getting bored of it. They were like, I'm so tired of these EDA streams. Build the models, because it would take us hours of just talking about how you get through these different these different data cleaning tasks. Um, so maybe maybe I'll do some recorded streams so that people can go back and, and look at that. Okay, Casado. All right, accent in the last syllable. Thank you. Um, that's the, that's the big problem with, with learning new languages is the, I found that it's not even the consonants or the vowels. Like I can get those with enough practice. It's the accent patterns and the, any kind of like, if there is any pitch changes or intonation, it's a nightmare. Anyway, back to density based clustering, my friends. So like I was saying, let's just bring ourselves back here. Cluster assignment here based on density, right? Where we're defining our clusters. Instead of distance, we're defining them as areas of high density surrounded by areas of low density. And the beautiful thing is we don't need to specify the number of clusters because we've defined precisely what a cluster is. So we're just having our model go through and identify where all the clusters are. MacGyver, you say you're from Denmark? Oh, oh. Hi, are you hiring? <laughs> Denmark, um, Sweden, the Netherlands, and Finland are the areas where I have opened up my, my LinkedIn profile. Like any of these places. All right. Okay. Instead of specifying the number of clusters, you know, every model has our tunable parameters. In this case, our tunable parameter, the thing that we can control is the threshold for density or distance. So we kind of can say, hey, this is how far out from the cluster you could be and still be part of the club. That's what you can tune here. And then this model goes and finds you all the clusters. Um, there is a job I really wanted to apply to that was in Denmark. Um, but it closes tonight and I didn't realize it. So rest in peace me. I was gonna be actually do doing work for the UN, which I would have loved, but I didn't, I thought it closed on the 30th and it closes on the 28th. So. Yes, I'm not applying to that. All right, um, pros versus cons. So here, pros are, it's really good if we have kind of more circular clusters. And by that, I mean, remember, remember the clusters we were drawing earlier. Actually, you don't have to remember because now I'm saving my blackboard. Oh God, what? No, please. these kinds of clusters, where lots of points are kind of equidistant from the centroid, giving us a kind of circular shape or spherical if we're dealing in more than two dimensions. Um, thank you, VilkX01, for following. So, let's see density-based clustering, yes. So circular clusters, it's wonderful. And it is actually rather scalable, more scalable at least than, than some of the other methods. The problem is the big con here 
is that it's not good if we have complex clusters or if we have clusters of different densities. It can't handle these things. Um, thank you, Ian Alex Hart, for the cheer. Thank you for the bits. Um, let's see. Uh, what do I mean by complex? Uh, yeah, shape-wise. So instead of like the nice circular clusters, maybe we've got some really wacky, you know, poly polygonal, I guess is the adjective there. Um, polygonal shapes instead of nice, nice circles. Um, Einstein, yes, um, I will. Have a good night, get some good sleep. Thank you for stopping by and thank you for following old newbie. Okay, the last kind of clustering that we're gonna talk about, and these names, you might hear other names for them. This is just, this, this is just one way that we can talk about clusters. Um, Sevro, thank you for following, is partitional clustering. Okay. And so here, what we're doing is we're dividing the data up into non-overlapping subsets. Okay. So one data point cannot have membership in more than one cluster. And no, I guess not complex as in real. So I should say, I should, I should specify this. Let me be a little clearer here. Do, 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 do. All right. Complexly, because that's a word, uh, shaped clusters. We're talking about shape here, not complex as in non-real. All right. Um, dividing the data into non-overlapping subsets. Um, each cluster has to have one member. And no, no, no worries. Okay, well, that, you know what? That might be, that might be um, a mistake that somebody will make when watching the VOD or reading the notes. So I should be very specific about what I'm saying. Um, and several you say, you randomly found me. Well, good, I'm glad you stumbled upon this stream. Um, you're introducing yourself to ML this winter. Ah, that's great. What kind of uh, machine learning have you done? And welcome. You have stopped by early enough. We, we This is just day five of 12. Um, if you're interested in any particular kind of machine learning, uh, check out the schedule. And Gamuza85, thank you for following. All right. Um, unfortunately, we do have to specify. We have to specify the number of clusters here. Um, and yes, Loafbone coming in days one through four. The VODs are on YouTube. Loafbone has just linked you. Um, the code is on GitHub as well as some of the uh, written notes, but the VODs are up as well. And uh, Octberg, thank you for following. And Severo, you say, um, you're following the MIT course, got up to Perceptron algorithms aimed to do facial recognition. Ooh, that's a contentious, contentious area of, of machine learning, my friend. Um, okay, this is also non-deterministic. So we repeat it, we might get different results. Um, our pros here, it's good. It's good with our, with our, with our circular clusters. And it's actually, it's pretty scalable. It's not bad, it's not bad all things considered. Our cons though, um, just like with the previous one, complex shapes, it's not so great with. Um, and <laughs> get back to his, your face. Um, I, well, I have mild face blindness, so I probably couldn't. All right, so what we're gonna be talking about um, tonight is a, um, it's kind of clustering called k-means. So let me see, how are my notes doing here? I'm trying to make them prettier for all of you since now I'm putting them online. Moonbear Studio, thank you for following. All right, so now I think we can go, we'll go here. 
zoom back into like 100, I guess. Oh no, too much. All right, there we go. And Ian Alex, sorry, thank you so much for the bits. What do I mean again by non-deterministic? Thank you, Acromonic. So a non -de let's let's start with deterministic. Determinism in general. Um, Christmas music after Christmas what? It's the current poll. Love phone, is that you? You butt. You little butt face. Christmas music, it's the 12 days of machine learning miss. Thank you. All right. So determinism is whether philosophy or physics, is the idea that if you know all of the inputs, you know the output. So if I know all of the parameters, if I am doing my, um, you know, my, my physics box on a ramp kind of thing, and I know the weight and I know friction and all of that goodness, I know the answer. Non-determinism means that we can't really reproduce it. If I were to run the same, you know, if I were to do the same situation over and over again, I would get different results. And so in this case, some of our clustering methods are deterministic. If I were to reproduce them, take the same data in the same order, feed it into the same clustering algorithm, I'd get the same results. And some of them are non-deterministic, meaning that I can feed the same data with the same number of clusters to the same model and get different results. And so it's good to specify that, especially when we're thinking as scientists and we're really interested in the reproducibility of our results. Uh, Dr. Vim and Dragontooth111, thank you for following. 80% chat disruption will make for an interesting YouTube lecture video. I I told myself I'd be better about the interruptions. Today's been a little a little more than usual, so I apologize. I have been a little more distracted. I feel like yesterday I was feeling a little better. Today the cold has kind of like reached up a little bit, and I've been a little more tired today. So my apologies. Um, I will I will do my best to to stay as focused as possible. All right. K means yeah, all caps. So what what is what is K means? So you'd love to hire me, but you're too busy to have employees. Fair enough. And you say, get to Scandinavia quick. I, trust me. Uh, I don't know if I'm ready for academia again, but I'm, I'm looking, my friend. I am. Um, and it is a fantastic platform for streaming, and it is hard to stay on track because I do love, love, love to answer questions. Um, okay. So what, what, what does K-means? So it's a type of partitional clustering, that type that we just talked about. Okay. Um, and this, this we're gonna have to remember for a second, that little graph that we drew earlier. So remember, we're not in Y, X space really anymore. We're kind of more, we're in our feature space. <laughs> oh no, why crying? Oh no, Ian Alex Hart, did I mess something up? <laughs> Thank you for the bits, even if they're with a sad face, though. <laughs> and thank you for following Squint Dev. Welcome. Taking a little break to draw some pictures here. Okay, so if you remember, what color haven't I used here? Oh, my least favorite color, but that's fine. Um, we will we will get there. Okay, so X Y space is analogous to feature space, not quite. Severo, yes and no. So the reason why I'm making a distinction here is so far what we've covered when it comes to X Y space is like linear and logistic regression. And that implies a relationship between a dependence, a, a correlation or causality between the features. Between your X and your Y, you have your independent variable, your dependent variable. There's a dependency there. When you're talking about clustering, there is no dependency necessarily. There might be, but there, there isn't proven uh, dependence necessarily. What we're talking about in this case are just two features. And so I'm trying to break out of this mindset of like the y equals mx plus b, our y, our label must depend on the input of our, of our feature vector. And I'm trying to get us to thinking about plotting our features 
and looking at relationships between features, not necessarily in that predictive way. That's why I kind of switched a little bit of the um, terminology here. So just a little bit of review of terminology. It does in linear regression, at least several. Well, that's, that's the assumption, right? Is that there's a linear relationship between your X and Y. Or in logistic, there's a logistic relationship. <laughs> yes, I know correlation is not causation. Um, all right, so these are our centroids, right? These are our centers of our clusters. I wanted to review this term really quick because we're going to be using it right now. Um, so the biggest, the biggest, the meatiest part of your k-means is going to be, oh, let's get rid of the pink. I'm sorry. I, lots of people love pink. Go for it. If pink's your favorite color, pinkify everything. I, it's not for me. Um, okay. So here's the process with k-means and it centers on something that has a fancy name, but is really, really simple, but we need our fancy names. So fine, which is called expectation maximization. And what the heck even is this? Um, M. Gengleder, thank you, thank you for following. What is expectation maximization? EM, if you say good old EM, I think of electromagnetism, which has some deeply disturbing flashbacks to graduate school. what I get for talking too much. Okay. Um. Oh, you wish I was your professor. Well, I wish I was your professor too. I like teaching. Okay. Expectation. Those of you who don't have a lot of experience with statistics or math, you might think of this word how we commonly use it in English, which is like you're waiting for something or you're expecting something to happen. Expectation, you can maybe think about that. It, you can think of it kind of almost like a prediction here. And so the expectation component of this is that we are going to, we're making an assumption almost. We're going to assign each data point to the nearest centroid. And here's that word nearest again. So what should be going off in your head, right? Just like with K nearest neighbors, a couple different red flags should, not red flags, but just like alarm bells should be going off. Scale a bit, like scale your data, normalize it, right? Standardize it. But also, how are we defining nearest? What is our distance metric? We often in, in streams have used our Euclidean distance, our Pythagorean theorem distance, because that's just really easy to understand, but also, Remember in your head that there are lots of different ways to define distance, especially when we get into like multi-dimensional spaces. So nearest is nearest depends on what metric we're using. Um, just as good Joe, exactly. What distance metric? You are like lockstep with me tonight. It's awesome. Okay. And then our maximization. And thank you, Panko, Ray, and Cockney Weasel for following. And with maximization, we're going to calculate the mean of all of the points in that cluster and redefine the centroid. And you might be sitting here going, what the actual heck? All right, there's a lot of words here. There's a lot of there's a lot of blackboard tonight, and I recognize that. But we're we're entering into a whole new area of machine learning, so I want to make sure that you you really understand what's going on. So I'm gonna I'm gonna condense this into some steps, <laughs> not the Minkowski metric, not tonight. Um, <laughs> that's really taking me back because we did Minkowski metric. The first time I saw Minkowski metric was not in machine learning; it was in cosmology. So um, and same with the like the Robertson Walker metric. Uh, Del, Del Begor, thank you for following. All right, so here's your, your, your k-means how to, I guess. 
Yeah, let's do that because it gives us two dashes. All right. You first specify K, which is your number of clusters. You're going to randomly, and here's, here's where the non-determinism comes in, because this is random, randomly initialize the centroid positions. Thank you for following a love dub W and Gatsukama. Thank you for following. Um, and then we're going to repeat our expectation and our maximization until the centroids don't move. This is what we would call it's converging. And just as a little, a little reminder, expectation. We are, um, thank you for the bits, Ian Alex. Are, oh, why? <laughs> I love that. I love the, like, I just, I'm sorry. This is slightly inappropriate. I think of that as such, like an orgasm face. Honestly, that's what it looks like to me. Um, it's pretty slow. If I only like one day on it in cosmology. Oh, I had to do the proofs of it. I had to derive that on an exam. It was brutal. All right. Um, expectation. Uh, we assign points to their nearest centroid. And then we maximize. We calculate the mean and redefine centroid. My hand hurts a little bit, can you tell? <laughs> My handwriting is getting crappy. All right, it is the organ. Okay, all right. Well, I don't want to be inappropriate, I'm just saying. I have a really cool gift for you, I found. So hold on. Please wait, I have like 500 tabs open. Let me find the cool gift that I saved for, for stream. Oh, Jesus, please tell me I saved it. All right. So, we'll zoom in a little bit here for y'all. Um. So here you can see expectation maximization happening in real time. It's not super dr drastic, but if you wait, pardon me. So we got five iterations um, where iteration one, you'll see the centroids are randomly, randomly put in. And then slowly we're just tweaking where those centroids are to fit the data. I mean, this is like really nice because the centroids seem to be perfectly placed already. But this is kind of illustrating what k-means is about. It's about moving the centers of the clusters. And so hopefully this is giving you um, a little bit of the, the idea. And here you'll see this SSE and you're probably like, what, what even is this? So does the sum, actually no. Somebody in chat, I gave, I gave away the first, the first thing we've used this particular error metric before. Does anyone remember? And if you know it, just, yes, okay, well, just as good, Joe, I knew that. I knew you'd know. If, hopefully you remember it from a previous stream where we used the sum of the squared error. In this case, I will be calling it sum of the squared distance because in here, error just, it feels like a harsh word. And really what we're talking about, I wanna reinforce this distance, distance, distance idea because that's really what we're gonna be what we're considering when we're talking about clustering is similarity and distance. Okay, my dears, are you ready for some code? Enough of the blackboard, enough of my bad handwriting. Am I right? Okay. So let's, 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 let's get down to some code here. Get ourselves set up. 150 seems to be the zoom that everyone loves, even if it messes with my notes. Actually, hold on. I'm gonna put my notes over here so I can, I've got a, a vertical monitor to my right that I usually keep the notes on. Um, but when I zoom in this much, I can't read my own notes. So, all right, let's, let's, let's get ourselves set up here. So I'm prepared for this. Okay, it better be C code. Hilarious. No, it's not C code. We're coding in Python, the language of machine learning. All right. So I'm going to copy paste 
my standard imports here with my standard matplotlib imports because and like stuff because I'm tired of having to type that out every stream. Oh no, I can't see the, the following. Thank you so much for following Sepava and Crap Crapa Krupa. Um I keep wanting to say Koopa. I'm just like in a Mario mood, I guess. Alright. And thank you, uh, Case and Smell for following. Alright. So, actually, I don't think this is gonna work. I'll move this back over here. I thought it would work. Well, poop. That's fine. Okay, my friends. So the data, that, are you ready for this? I'm super excited. So I know that I've been waxing eloquent lately, not that I'm eloquent, about the need to understand the classic machine learning data sets. Well, tonight we're not gonna be using one. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Nate, nay, like Nate Dreamer. Um, because, you know, I've introduced you to some of the great ones. We've talked about the Titanic data set, the Boston housing data set. There's also like the, there's another housing data set, like I said, I, Ames, Iowa. Anyway, there's another housing data set, whatever houses are boring. Um, Iris data set. Let's, let's use some fun data. That's what I thought tonight. I was like, you know what? I could reuse one of these classic data sets, but let, let's, let's do some fun data. Uh, what did I call it? Spotify data. Let's talk music, right? I thought that would be fun. So this is like, what am I read data? Just goodness. All right. So I have a data set of the songs on Spotify from the year 1921 to 2020. Aw, yeah. We've got some fun data for us tonight, right? Okay, come on. If you're geeking out with me, you should be a data science because only data scientists, I feel like, would get super excited about like, yes, a data set. <laughs> I, I, I geek out with the data. But, so, let's take, let's, let's take a look at, let our, at our, at our data here. So what are we dealing with? We got valence, which by the way, I don't understand, but apparently that's something that is in all the Spotify data sets. I forgot to look it up. Sorry, maybe one of you wonderful humans can look that up for me and tell me what valence means when it comes to music. We have year, acousticness, which is cool. Uh, Sot Lucas, thank you for following. Uh, we have the artists, danceability, which just, let's, Hold, please. They have a measurement of dance, how well I can dance to it. Like, sorry, Rachmaninoff. <laughs> You're not very danceable. <laughs> I love that there's a danceability. We have the duration in milliseconds. We have the energy. We have whether or not is it, it is explicit. We have an ID, looks like a hash of some kind. We have the instrumentalness, because that's a word. Uh, the key, which probably, is that the musical key? Looks like it, probably. Um, okay, loaf bum. In Spotify's API, something called valence that describes the musical positiveness conveyed by a track. Tracks with high valence sound more positive, happy, cheerful, euphoric, while tracks with low valence sound more emo, basically. Okay, so it's the lack of emo-ness of a song. I just think of valence electrons, but you know, whatever, Spotify, you do you. Okay, we have the liveness, the loudness, the mode. Actually, will you look up mode too, love bum? Thank you. Um, term J, 94, Sot Lucas, M.H. Zanariman. Uh, thank you so much for following and welcome. Um, we have the name of the song. We have a measurement of its popularity. We have its release date. We have the speechiness. Is that like whether or not it's like spoke? It's so like the rapness essentially of it. And we have the tempo. So I'm guessing it's like maybe beats per minute would be my guess. But in any case, you're feeling like a 0 0.653 valence. Um, modal, okay, it's major or minor of the track. Cool. Thank you, love bone. I'm geeking, by the way, because I've done all of this already. I've done all the code for this stream. And it is hysterical what I found. So stay with me, my friends. 
I found something absolutely hilarious about the human race from this data set. So, all right. Um, let's see, let's see the top artists. 1921 to 2020, we're talking almost a hundred years. Who are, who are dropping the beats here? Oh my God, I'm gonna sound so old. I don't even know what the cool kids say when it's like a cool artist. So, Ernest, wait, Ernest Hemingway? That's what that says. Hemingway? But like, I think that's Ernest Hemingway, which Ernest Hemingway is, is making some amazing, is making some sick beats apparently. Uh, Eric Maria Remark. I'm very ignorant when it comes to music. I know a bit of classical cause I, I, I play some instruments, but then we have Francisco Canaro, Frank Sinatra, Ignacio Crescini, Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, Bob Dylan, the Rolling Stones and the Beach Boys. So these are, wait, seriously, I'm kind of, <laughs> hold please. I, I, I skimmed this earlier because I was just prepping, making sure that things didn't like, you know, break. Uh, what I call it? I called it raw data, didn't I? What on earth? Oh, whatever, it's being, is it dot lock? I don't use pandas anymore. It's not dot lock, dot i lock, no. Anyway, it's fine. I'm not gonna deal with pandas. I don't use pandas anymore, unfortunately. So my, my panda skills are rough, I'm sorry. I'm just kind of curious, like why, why does Ernest Hemingway have 1200? Maybe those are like spoken, um, uh, audiobooks? Yeah, all 1442 saying audiobooks. I think you might be right. Because there are podcasts and things like that on Spotify. So it looks like Ernest Hemingway is has is the most prolific. But has Ernest Hemingway... These have to also have, like, different people reading the books. I don't... I'm not sure how prolific he is. I didn't think he had written, like, 1,211 books. But maybe I'm just also ignorant about literature. Um... Heavy side, thank you for following. Oh my goodness, Ian Alex Hyde, thank you so much for the gift sub. You are just, thank you. What is the mean danceability of Hemingway? <laughs> let's let's see, hold on. Um, So raw data, it was being weird. Um, I feel like, I feel like my panda's knowledge is, 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 is struggling tonight. Why am I messing with this? So, Location. No, I feel like you can index. Am I just doing the numpy thing? I feel like I'm just in in numpy land here. So, because this didn't work, it's pooping itself. I'm not going to assume I'm not given one. Um, I because that's not a series, so I can't do value counts. Um, but I lock is for integer locations, right? I mean, I'll try it. God, this is the problem with. So somebody asked me, what do I use instead of pandas? Well, the vast majority of my data lately um, has been imagery or has, so, so it's been in a form that is more easily convertible just to arrays. And really for machine learning, if you want to do machine learning that is very, very fast on very massive data, you want to be able to optimize things for GPUs. And really what you're talking about there is linear algebra, turning everything into an array. And so, um, so that's what I thought, but it looks like they're lists. They're all lists, GB Stew. So we've got a bunch of, of lists of artists here. In any case. Ernest Hemingway. Okay, well, let's also, we, we do have a problem though, which is for machine learning, right? We can't pass strings unless we're going to, we're going to do some one hot encoding. Here though, I don't feel like that's necessary because the hash ID, the name, the artist, um, and the release date, we don't really need these things. We already have a year that, that it came out. I don't think we need the exact date. I think year is a good substitute there. Um, I don't think we, we need any of, trying to do any kind of encoding on things like name or hash would result in problems and wouldn't even be helpful. So we're gonna, we're gonna drop these. 
And yes, Panda can extract an empty arrays from the data. You're absolutely right. But if it, Panda's also, computationally speaking, when you're working it with extremely large data sets, can actually, it is going to be a lot slower than num NumPy or SciPy. NumPy, whatever. Um, so if you can avoid calls to, um, to Pandas, it's better. Um, so Mediocre Gamer, for now, I'm not going to go into that kind, that level of granularity because this data set is, is, is rather large. Um, it actually, what, what? Oh, I keep calling it raw data. Duh, because I'm smart and I did this. I've got 170,000 songs. So for the sake of stream, I'm going to reduce our dimensionality a little bit. But you're absolutely right. Um, so in this case, let's, 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 let's drop some of these. Um, the ones that I chose to drop, artists. We'll use these later, but for now we're going to drop them. Uh, name and release date. And they are columns, so we're going to specify our axis here. What are you pooping about now? Oh my gosh. There we go. Okay. Um, give me one second. Actually, I have to... Where did my little thing go? Did the music just change? You all heard that, right? Okay. It was like we got a little bit of another another song for a second. That was a little bit trippy. Um, okay, YouTube. I'm not gonna mess with it. I'm not gonna touch Chrome anymore. Cause I don't wanna know what that was, but that was a little bit strange. Okay. <clears throat> Spotify knows I'm working with the data. I'm actually using YouTube right now. <laughs> okay. So now we have our data. We're all dealing with floats and integers. We're in, we're in happy, happy land. Um, one of our checks that we should always do. Do we have any nulls? No, thank you, data set. Perfect, we have a complete data set. This is fantasy land here where we don't have any problems with it. We can also look for each of our features. We can look at these key statistical measurements. Count is the first one that I look at. Those should all be equal, but we just checked if there are any nulls and there isn't, so they should all be the same, and they are. That's a good sanity check to always get in the habit of doing is like, is my data complete? Do I have missing data? We can also see how much things vary, and you can see, look at the standard deviations between these different, different features. There is a reason that we need to normalize our data, okay? And we will. Did I read the deep learning book? I think you will have to be more specific. Which book? All right. Um, let's just do another little check here. We have no, we all got floats and ints. So we are, we are ready to go. We can also look at the um, 25 by 25. Is that what I used? Yeah, that looks nice. We can look at the distributions of each of our um, mean danceability is, is 0.53 gives most, there are a lot of audiobooks. Oh, okay. Um, we can see the distribution of our different features and especially when you're doing explore, exploratory data analysis, I'm going to slow down because I'm also starting to lose my voice. Mic here so I can lean back a little bit. All right. Um, and I think, I think you are right, Strawberry Jesus, because also look at like the instrumentalness here. Like a lot of it is, well, I guess that's maybe a measurement of how much, not how many instruments or something, but like whether or not it's instrumental. Um, most of the music is not. Um, my hunch here would probably be that this is the major key, would be just just a hunch. Well, let's see, what does our valence look like? Oh, our valence is Gaussian-ish. Um, also seeing that like, we've got, you know, humanity is increasing and then plateauing in its output of music, at least on the Spotify platform. Um, I don't know if I've, I've read that one. I can't remember the last time I finished a textbook or like a reference book. Usually I just kind of grab certain chapters. Um, 
I know, Casado. Casado. No, Cas. Yeah, Casado. There we go. Conjios. I'm working on this. Thank you for your patience. I've actually never learned any Spanish. <laughs> um, I know, right? This is the beauty that is pandas, is that there's some built-in plotting that happens, which is really, really nice. I know. Don't miss 80, 877 says, people finish textbooks. Do they? Um, I've got this one, which is great reference. <laughs> I also love that, like, I love that it's green. So my green screen's picking it up. So, ooh, you can like see my code through the textbook. Um, this is a really great reference for machine learning that covers a lot of the math behind it. Um, it's dense. It is dense as hell. I'll, 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 I'll warn you there. But especially, um, especially if you are interested in like a deeper dive into the mathematics, this is really great. Um, and any linear algebra recommendations? Ooh, let me think about that one. I'm gonna be sassy and say my stream because I'm gonna be doing math streams, but let me let me think about that just as good, Joe, and I'll get back to you. Okay. I wanna know the I wanna know the key, because it looks like whatever the zeroth key is, is it going like C major? Like going in terms of like the musical progression of the keys? I don't know. Um, who's the author for this one is Kevin Murphy. Loudness, all right tempo, speechiness, popularity. There's lots of stuff that is not popular, which is also interesting. Um, live, liveness. So we're able to see the distribution of our features. We also see that we do have some binary features in here as well, um, mode and explicit. Um, so I think Pango Ray, uh, Lofbone looked it up and mode is whether or not it's a major or minor key. Um, so we'll be we'll be trusting Loafbone, our wonderful, wonderful mod. How did fig size output those histograms? It didn't. Data.hist, my friend. Alright. So we can also do our correlation matrix, right? And we can look at the correlation of each of these features with another. And here's here's one of the most hilarious things ever, right? I was curious. I was looking at this data before stream. I was like, yeah. So I was like, popularity. Okay, so something's really indication. Year. That makes sense, right? The more recent things will be more popular. So I was like, apart from year, let's 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 put year aside for a second. What is the next most indicative thing? So We'll look at the negative in a second, but this is reasonably strong compared to the rest. So what's that? Energy. Okay, that also makes a lot of sense. Um, did I look at it wrong? Hold on, where is it? Popularity. Um, do, 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 do. What is this one? I... No, yes, okay, this isn't giving it away. It isn't giving away the hilarious thing that I found later. An acousticness. So people don't like acoustic music. <laughs> according to this. They like things that are very energetic. And what is this down here? Loudness. Okay, reasonably. We, li we like louder music. It's interesting. Good, and I'm so glad, because when I was reading this earlier, I was worried this gave away the, um, the funny thing that I found from clustering. It doesn't. Ha! All right. So, I found personally that this is a lot of numbers. And it can be hard to kind of just instantaneously look across this. Like, I should be wearing my glasses, but also it's just, it's a lot of numbers. So one thing you can do is uh, you can plot it. Oh no, I need a comma. All right, there we go. Um, I find that Seaborn's heat map here is awesome. Uh, if you don't know the Seaborn library in Python, you should check it out. It's wonderful. And thank you for following Jason Gru Grulex. So this is a visualization of the correlation matrix that we just looked at. Uh, thank you, Lightstalker, for following. So here we have a little bit of 
of a better view of the relationship between our various our various features, right? So we can see an inverse kind of relationship between energy and acousticness. I guess that kind of makes sense. Um, we can also see, um, let's see, we've got, where's this, acousticness? So an inverse relationship with loudness, with popularity, <laughs> and with year. We've had fewer acoustic songs, I guess, as the years have gone, gone on, um, which makes sense. So that that would be interesting also to look at if we were to limit our data set. Here, here's the way you should think, by the way, when you're doing EDA. We, I, I made a bit of a mistake earlier, just an assumption. I said, oh, wow, like acousticness is kind of inversely correlated with popularity. Pfft. Must mean people don't like acoustic songs, right? That would be really, really dangerous, right? Because look at the relationships. Acousticness is also inversely correlated with year, which we know is very positively correlated with popularity. So is it in fact that people don't like acoustic songs or is it that fewer of them have been created? in more recent years, and so therefore it seems like they're less popular. Something to think about. Uh, Synth Overseer, thank you for following. Um, all right, so now we are ready to start building our clustering algorithm. And I'm coming to the question that a lot of you have been asking me since the start, which is in K means you have to specify a K. How many clusters do we want? How do you know how many clusters to pick? Well, I'm gonna introduce you to something hilariously named the elbow method. <laughs> I know, it's, it's a very silly name, but this is going to, this is, this is our, our systematic way of determining how many clusters we want, okay? So let's get, let's get our, our standard scalar. Um, and yes, elbow plots are also good for the PCA. No, this isn't a method, Jess. All right, let's scale our data. No, data, it is data. Oh my gosh, goofy me. There we go. It's, 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 you know what? It's a stream of, of the tiny mistakes today. So thank you for your patience, my friends. And several of you say, wait, doesn't that mean that there's a problem with the expression of our popularity matrix? Um, well, popularity, I'm not sure how Spotify measures it, but we do know that it correlates very strongly with when the song came out, which makes sense. Like maybe they're doing it by the number of plays as, a, you know, a fraction of all of the songs played or something like that. So, so All right, I'm back. I didn't mute myself. This cord is, I must have bumped it. I have tried so hard not to bump it. It is the most finicky cord. I'm so sorry, friends. I've tried everything I can to like put this in a position where you can hear me, but also where I don't bump it. It's not, it's, oh, it's wired. It's literally the wire. I've actually replaced the cord and it's still, so it must be the mic. I'm almost tempted to go back to my, my just my blue snowball. Because I love, I love the mic arm. I love being able to move it around. But this, like, it just craps out on me periodically, so. Okay. What was I saying? Spotify, right. We were talking about the um, quantifying popularity. So, um, sometimes duct tape stabilizes the connection. I'll try anything at this point. This is a newer chord, though. And Nutbuster007, what happened to your game dev journey? We've paused game dev briefly for um, to, to do our 12 days of machine learning, but we will, we will be back to game development following, following this series of streams, do not worry. And Safakoi, thank you for following. So to repeat where I was before, um, we were talking about popularity, right. And I was saying that 
if we were to quantify popularity effectively, we'd have to talk about like maybe weighting it a little bit by year. So is something more popular because it got, you know, 100,000 plays when there are, you know, however many billions of people in the world? Or is it more popular if it continues to be played today um, despite it being 100 years old? So yeah, like if, if we were really interested in quantifying popularity more effectively, there are far more features and parameters that would go into that and a more elegant way that we could probably quantify the popu popularness of a song. I think for the sake of this, it's interesting to see what makes people play songs, even if it's more recent. Um, and Domus877, uh, thank you, thank you for following. And of course, Severo, I'm not bringing it down to your level. You have had wonderful insight, so there's no bringing it down, I promise. We're all here learning different things. Okay, my friends, we've scaled our data, which you should always scale your data. I swear, it's just gonna be on a t-shirt <laughs> at some point. That'll be, like, people ask, like, oh, can we have a stream t-shirt? And I'm like, what would I even put on it? Um, but I guess maybe scale your data with, like, an angry face from me <laughs> would be something I would do. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're going to... We're gonna test this. We're gonna test this out. Also, as an astronomer, I keep writing this... SDSS. So somebody in chat, be my, be my like code watcher for a minute. I made so many typos when I was testing this code because of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is abbreviated SDSS. And I meant this to be our sum of square distances. So <laughs> you want a Hubble t-shirt? Oh, please. Yeah. Nobody wants my face on it. Let's get Hubble on a t-shirt. I'd wear a Hubble t-shirt. All right. All right, and then I'll explain this in a second. Let me just get it going because it does take a couple minutes to run. Um, so I want to get this part started and then I can tell you what we're doing. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to test on our data. We're going to try to fit it with one cluster, with two clusters, with three clusters, and so on. We're going to continue to go through. I picked 20. Spoiler alert, I tested this before stream. This gives us a nice, a nice curve. Um, and then we're going to look at, for each of these number of clusters, what is the sum of the squared distances here called inertia? How dense are our clusters? Ideally, we want to find, you know, the number of clusters that minimizes our sum of square distances. We want really, really, really dense clusters. We don't want very diffuse spread out clusters that would kind of defeat the purpose. So this is called the elbow method. I'm giving it away. Hold on, actually I need to wait because we're only halfway through because of the cool graph that we get when we're done. And MC Sendo, thank you for following. And I'm gonna get the code ready here for our graph. Um, yes. Is it a single line? Yeah, and then I want this to be a little bit more. Um, X here is the number of clusters. And then... Alright. Um, you said you just saw my channel got very excited because of AI. AI, it would be great if you could stream some of this topic in 2021. I'm planning on it. So it looks like... Um, we're going to be actually be, we're going to be bringing in the new year with, with neural nets. So we're going to be doing, um, 
ensembling, well, we already did that, unsupervised, supervised learning, the most basic babyest of reinforcement learning. And then starting the new year, stuff's gonna get complicated, my friends, okay? So get, like, get prepared because I would say all this stuff, I'm trying to keep it really basic and our most complicated models are going to be in the new year. You know, but your new year's resolutions to learn machine learning, right? So you should all be here, clearly. Um, I will say, that um, New Year's Eve this year is the stream's three year anniversary. I usually do video games. I'm considering co-streaming with some other with some other streamers. We're all talking about it. We'll see if we'll see if we can make it happen. Um, but so I'm gonna take a little bit of a break from the reinforcement learning, the technical stuff to relax with some you know alcoholic beverages and some video games. So hopefully you all will also still stop by just to hang out and celebrate three years of my stream. It's amazing, I didn't think, apparently I've been streaming for three years. Cool beans, right? Um, so, exciting, exciting stuff. Um, ooh, we are almost done here. Taking a little bit longer since I'm streaming, so thank you for your patience. Um, and Ian Alex Hart, thank you for the bits! Woohoo! Yeah, three year anniversary. I'm super excited. I never honestly thought I'd do anything like this with the stream. Um, I started out just playing video games with friends. It was like really casual. My brother convinced me to do it after I got dumped. And so I was like, what's what's the harm? Like, yeah, let's let's do this. Uh, popcorn fake, thank you for following. Um, and uh, it's only been this year that I've switched from video games into streaming more technology stuff. And it seems to be, you all seem to like it. So I think I'll keep up with it. Um, I think the plan is after the 12 days of machine learning, we'll go back to having Science Sundays I'll be starting a series of um, a series of streams on math, so we'll have Math Mondays. Uh, Tuesdays will continue and stay viewers' choice. So if people make any redemptions with their channel points for games or they want to redeem a science topic, that would be for Tuesdays. In lieu of those redemptions, I do a poll. And Thursdays will be me learning game development. And so far, that'll be the schedule for the stream post the twelve days of machine learning. This, all right. Looks like we are set here. This is the elbow method. So as you can see, as our number of clusters increases, our sum of squared distances decreases. Now, the problem here is that we're not looking for the minimum. We're not looking for the densest clusters because technically if we're looking for the densest clusters, then we'd have cluster, like our K would just equal the number of data points. Really what we want to look for is like the crook of the elbow. You can't even see my elbow. Elbow. The point at which the graph starts to flatten. So here I picked 10 because that seems to be about the point where the distance between the drop, our change in Y here, seems to be lessening. So in Strawberry Jesus, you say someone was asked about data pre-processing streams. Good, yes, I mean, I, <laughs> the irony being, this is, this is the, the beautiful irony, is I did many of them and they didn't seem to be very popular. People really wanted to learn more about the models. And now that I'm doing the models, people want the processing, which is totally fine. Also, now that we're doing the YouTube um, record of the VODs from the streams, I'll be able to put those streams on YouTube so you all can go and see them. But I have no problem talking about EDA. That is like my soapbox counter is going to go through the roof, though. I've got all kinds of feelings about, about EDA. Um, thank you for following the dev. Um, all right. So from this, I'm going to eyeball it and say that we're going to we're going to use 10 clusters here. OK. Oh, it's N clusters. And then. And I'm gonna make a really, really ugly graph for all of you. All right, are you ready? This is gonna be awful, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Actually, you know what? I'm not even gonna do it, my friends. I am gonna freaking copy paste it because I don't wanna write all of this out and nobody wants to just sit here and watch me write code. So. The point here, this is gonna be, this is gonna be rough. Um, Tapir2342, thank you for following. The point here is that I wanted to show you 
that if you do have less less um, data points than we do, fewer data points than we do, and you have fewer clusters, you might be able to effectively uh, visualize them. In our case, give it a second, let it chug a lug. We're gonna we're gonna have a little bit of a harder time because we are working with a higher dimensional spread of data, so we can we're only really visualizing it here in three dimensions. Um, so it's not gonna be it's we're kind of compressing things a little bit. Um, but you can also kind of get an idea of the fact that our data is, we have different clusters and now we can kind of see at least a little bit of that clustering. So you might be asking though, well, what now? Like, cool, we have clusters. Who the hell cares? Am I right? So let's, let's first, let's get our, let's get our predictions. Let's get our predictions and let's merge them with our data from before. So that now we can look at different songs and we can see what cluster they're part of which is really, really danceable audiobooks. The pink is all in this timing way. <laughs> um, but so I'm, I'm really interested in what's popular. I don't know, that's kind of like what was interesting to me. So um, actually, no, I want to do dot popularity, needs, values, gracious almighty. And then, so it looks like um, cluster five, cluster five is the most is the most popular. So I'm kind of curious, what's in cluster five? Um, hopefully, I'm not goofing this indexing. We got some 1921 in there, 1927, what? So all of that thought about, okay, the most popular songs, they've gotta be like off put, so let's see. Do you wanna know what I found? This is the hysterical thing. This is something that I found really, really funny. Are you ready for this? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm remembering. This cracked me up. You want to know? I've been through a bunch of these different these different features and you want to know the one thing they all have in common? Are you ready for this? Sweat this cracks me up. Okay. I'm sorry. Human beings love our skanky songs. I'm not really sure what counts as, you know, explicit in 1927. They're all explicit. We love swearing in songs is what this is telling me. And I find that hysterical. I literally, when I got this, I was like, And so, um, I also think some of these might be off, like some of the years might be off. So I wonder if we dropped year two, what might happen? Cause like, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I could totally be wrong, but like, in any case, that, that is what, how many songs were there in that cluster? Um, <laughs> That many. So there were 117,000 in that cluster. Uh, Danush PN, thank you for following. And the thing that they all had in common was they were explicit. Uh, Minaya Koob, thank you for following. 
Uh, it's the explicit. Um, whether or not the song is marked as being explicit. So I guess, I, I think that can mean swears. It can also mean other things, right? So I think it can mean a crude, like, if, if there's, like, sexual words in the song, I think it's still sometimes labeled as explicit. I don't personally know, like, the... Is that the motion picture? Is that MPAA? I don't know who does the music rules, but if the album was marked explicit, essentially, if it would be marked explicit in modern times, uh, that's, that's a measurement, which I just, oh my god. Human beings, I love you all. Good lord. It's hilarious. Um, but I also think, you know, this is, this is, this is kind of a useful way to view your clusters if you don't have as many clusters or as many data points as we do. And yes, explicit is marked in the data. Um, and data disciples say, love watching people code. It's so soothing. Yes, isn't it? Like, I like it too. Um, that's why oftentimes when I'm working, I actually have like a, a science and technology stream up while I'm working. And I don't, I don't have the lyrics. Um, I do not have the, the lyrics in this data set. However, Hopefully, hopefully this is illustrated to you the kinds of um, valuable things that we can extrapolate from clustering that even if we don't have labels, we can still explore interesting connections to our data. I'm going to switch back to our just chatting. Also, I think, like I mentioned at the start of the stream, I want you to also take away from this that clustering can be a very useful pre-processing tool. In addition to looking at things like your correlation matrix um, and looking at all of those different statistical measurements of the, the distribution of your various features, clustering can be really, really useful to kind of see groupings or patterns within the data before you even apply a supervised machine learning model to it. So in that case, I think it's, not, it, it's, it's incredibly useful, not just on its own. And when we talk about anomaly detection tomorrow, we're going to use clustering with a twist. So instead of looking for membership in a cluster, we're gonna look, we're gonna look for the weirdos. We're gonna look for the ones that don't belong in a cluster. Instead of measuring togetherness, how do we measure otherness? And that's something that we're gonna talk about tomorrow. I'm a swap for pause. Sounds like an excellent name. Thank you for following. So in the last like, you know, five or so minutes of stream, while Loafbone is, is prepping, a poll for Tennessee's nightly song for you. Um, do you have any questions? Are there any leftover questions I missed? Is there anything that you want to tell me, talk about really quick before we start wrapping things up for the evening? And Tofu90, thank you for following. Hmm. Actually, to give you an example um, of clustering that I used, uh, I used clustering on a human trafficking data set to see relationships between groups of survivors of human trafficking. I know that sounds very, very uh, dark. A lot of, you know, my focus, as I told you guys before, um, my focus at work is humanitarian applications for, for machine learning. So unfortunately, a lot of the data I work with is, is less is less joyful than, than Spotify songs, um, but still just as valuable, if not more. Uh, Clarky and Ninja Betch, thank you for following. Um, and so especially I found clustering can be useful when you're looking for not just patterns within the data, but you suspect that there might be subgroups within your data. Um, and SDKCL, thank you for following, and TTIPM. Do we want a lot of clusters or less clusters but meaningful? So this, this is the difficulty. So more clusters, we might run into the problem of we're, we're losing the meaning, meaningfulness. We're losing the usability. That's why we use that elbow method, right? We want to minimize, we want to minimize our sum of square distances, but we don't want to go so granular that we miss out on what these things have in common. Um, Manika Stuv, thank you for following. And, uh, so all of you, please vote in the straw poll. This is what Tennessee is going to sing for you tonight. Tennessee is my dog, those of you who are new. He sings to you every night. Um, please, please vote. 
for what, what he should sing to. He loves singing. He gets treats out of it. He's a very happy boy when he gets to sing for you. Um, at some point, I do want to get so... Um, one of the producers of, of Stargate follows me on Twitter, and I'd love to get him in stream sometime just to have Tennessee sing for him. Um, and just as good, Joe, you ask, are there applications where you'd like to allow data to exist in multiple groups at once? Absolutely. And so the partitional clustering that we talked about, so k-means, doesn't allow for that, but other kinds of clustering does. Um, and so that might be... What that might be... And I'm thinking ahead to anomaly detection a little bit because that's, that's really... To be honest, I use clustering, like I said, more as pre-processing. I haven't really used it explicitly except in that human trafficking case. Um, but when it comes to anomaly detection, what's really interesting is that you can have clusters and you can have subclusters. Um, and so, oh, thank you for the, thank you for the gift sub and yay, Severo, now you have a sub. Um, so with, with the case of clusters and subclusters, that's where the kind of, you might want to have membership in more than one cluster. Um, same with kind of the hierarchical approach where it might be interesting to examine what a parent cluster and a child cluster membership looks like. And War Control, you say, I have a question. I don't know anything about ML, but can someone make an AI that work at home with ML process? Um, what do you mean? Like, that'll work for you from home? <laughs> um, and Severo, you say, please touch on your work every now and then. Your sister and comp sign yourself medicine desire to work in humanitarian efforts, especially trafficking eventually. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Um, so actually, some good news. Uh, speaking of medicine, I found out today that I will be able to get a vaccine for COVID um, hopefully next week as uh, I volunteer with my fire department. And I've actually done some modeling for them as well. And that's like this wonderful mix of both medicine and, and kind of like the human humanitarian uh, humanitarian application as well. Um, I've also done a lot of COVID modeling uh, for work as well. Um, the COVID modeling that I was really working with was thankfully, it was, it was strange, it was the first time, and they, te amo mucho, thank you for following. It was the first time I've gotten to work with like a subject matter expert who designed the math, and then it was more about us finding ways to do the implementation or to take kind of the the math that they knew about in epidemiology and expand it and apply machine learning to it, which was really, really cool. Um, so that was a very unique experience for me. Um, but let's see, Val Valentasio, you say, did a course under Andrew several years ago, but it feels like it's time to brush up and learn more. All the previous videos will stay up. Yes, okay, so all of the previous videos are on YouTube. Um, Notes and code are on GitHub, so you can use the YouTube command and the GitHub command to find the links for all of that. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm regularly posting all of the links. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Strawberry Jesus, you can ask for career tips all you want. Um, I love giving advice and helping people. Um, please vote in the straw poll, by the way, for Tennessee's song. Um, I'm gonna go grab him now, and then he will sing for you. And, oh no, hold on, wait, we have a raid. Hi, raiders. Well, we'll, we'll push back 10 song a little bit then. Hi, raiders. Hi, Tayano Inoue. Hi, everyone. Math raid. I know, I think you raided. These streams are running together for me. It might have been yesterday, it might have been the day before. Nevertheless, thank you and welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the awesome fifth day of the 12 days of machine learning. Today we had a little bit less math. I don't, I'm not sure if we, I'm not sure if we, we had any math today, friends, because we, we talked about clustering and we've done all the math for it in previous streams. Thank you, Ket D, for following. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we talked today, this is, this is our first foray, uh, into unsupervised, yeah, on the fifth day of machine learning, miss, my true love gave to me, uh, somebody help me with the rhyming. Clustering? That's supervised machine learning in a pear tree? <laughs> I don't know, I can't do it. Um, and not prof and femvox fan, thank you so much for following. Um, don't worry if you missed the first four days. The VODs are on YouTube. 
The code and notes will also be on Google. So you haven't missed anything. It's very easy to catch up. Virtual assistant, thank you for following as well. Um, so actually, yeah, let me, so we were about to wrap stream up, but all of you wonderful people just showed up. So I'll push, push things back a little bit and instead we can do just a little bit of a Q&A for, for a bit. Um, and maybe I can still apply to that job. Well, it, it closes at midnight Denmark time. So I think I'm actually past, past the, past the cutoff, but that's okay. You know, I, I, I will find, I will, I will apply for those kinds of jobs in the future. Um, and pure Beskar, thank you for following. Yeah, whoops, strawberry Jesus. Well, <laughs> fly to Singapore and apply from there. No, they even specified it had to be like by midnight Copenhagen time. So rest in peace, Jess's attempt to work for the UN. That's fine. It's okay. It'll be all right, my friends. I I, I need a little bit. I want to move, don't get me wrong, but um, especially with COVID and everything, I think I need a more stable year before considering a, a cross-continent Cross globe move <laughs> um, but in any case uh, tonight I think was really interesting so I know it was a little bit more heavy on the blackboard uh, than than the code tonight but I think the thing with with clustering is there's so many different kinds and ways to approach this idea of distance and that is the that is the struggle with clustering and with any of our distance metrics is like you have to start wrapping your head around the fact that it's it's a lot harder than you think to measure the distance between two points. And so really that's what I wanted to kind of impress upon you today. That and scale your data, <laughs> always. All right, um, and let's see. Hangs, hangs mate and none, you say, so you live in the US and you wanna to move to Europe eventually, indeed. Um, and Severa, you ask if I've decided which country I wanna settle in. Um, I, have opened my resume on LinkedIn to job offers within Denmark, Finland, Sweden, and the Netherlands. And not prof, you say distance metric sounds like geometry. Sounds like cosmology to me, but yes. Um, measuring the distance between two points is, is more complicated than you think, especially when you're dealing with multi-dimensional spaces. And Skugit, you ask, what topics in mathematics are necessary for machine learning? Linear algebra is helpful. It depends on how far you want to go in machine learning. Um, you need to have a good handle on statistics and linear algebra. Um, to really get past the basic models, you need calculus. So it does take a lot of, a lot of, a lot of math. But have no fear, because after the 12 days of machine learning, I'm going to start a series of streams called Math Mondays. And so we'll be doing math together. I will be starting from the ground up because one thing I realized is I was looking at, I was interviewing with a lot of different teachers and professors and talking to a lot of people about when they fell out of love with math, when they stopped doing math. And the vast majority of people said it was somewhere around algebra. And so that's where we're gonna start. Uh, more zero n and don rick nl thank you for following and so at least for me i think um i want to start where people get lost i want to start where they like you know didn't where they where they didn't want to do math anymore and for me if, if if people started to fall out of love with math and start to have misconceptions and struggle in algebra then that's where we're going to start and i i've seen a lot of math streams on twitch but they're always doing calculus they're doing more advanced math and i feel like that's such a selective audience like really the point of my streams is to grab the most amount of people that i can and kind of bring them with me and so we're going to be starting with the simpler math for that reason um i see yogi what is the best way to investigate scientific da data given by the gaia project oh interesting let's say i want to find anomalies in those data sets or try to find exoplanets so um I've seen some really, really interesting work done with Gaussian processes. Because if you if you think about it, it's not just anomaly detection. It's 
you're, you're working with time series data. So you're also talking about repetitive, cyclical, you're, you're talking about periodic motion fundamentally, right? So there, there's some really cool models that can look for that. Unfortunately, I haven't seen a lot of machine learning applied in astrophysics. Um, some, but not a lot. The data is very, very noisy. So you also have to have an approach that's very, very um, resistant to highly, highly noisy data. Um, cost Q, thank you for following. And algebra is beautiful. I love algebra. I love math in general. Um, fractions, not prof. Yes, fractions. So I've taught math for about, how old am I? About 14, 13 to 14 years now. And um, I've done everything from, I think the, the earliest age I've taught is third grade. And the oldest age I've taught is multivariable calculus. Um, Voluntasia, thank you for subscribing and welcome. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Goodness. Um, and it's, it is tough because, and Kelfron, thank you for following. Um, I found this, and I don't know, I don't know, not prof or any of uh, any of the rest of you, if you found this. Um, the hardest thing is that, especially in elementary school, you all might think, okay, well, elementary school math, it's easy, right? Well, the problem is that elementary school teachers, my mom was an elementary school math teacher. Brilliant, by the way. She's awesome. She's one of the exceptions where she really learned her math. Thank you for the bits, Ian Alex Hart. And Hang's Mate Denone, thank you for following. That actually is Hang's Mate in one. I'm trying here. I'm bad with the usernames. Thank you all for your patience. And Aldu, thank you for following. Um, goodness, I'll get them someday. Like, I don't know what, I don't, I'm, like, the way that I break them down is nonsensical. It doesn't help being a polyglot, because I'm, like, trying to translate them into a bunch of different languages when they're just English. Anyway, um, one of the things that I've noticed in elementary school math that you might think is, is so, so simple, but difficult, is that a lot of those teachers don't have a background in math. They're like homeroom teachers. They teach every subject. And it's just assumed, right, that elementary school math is so easy so anyone can do it. My mom right now is probably like waking up. She, she sleeps early and she's probably waking up and being like, are you effing kidding me? Math is not easy and it should be taught properly. But like when I have taught in elementary school classrooms, the questions I get, I have had to pull from algebra. I've had to pull from calculus to answer the questions. If I hadn't taken that, that level of math, I wouldn't be able to answer them. And Samurai Angel 86, thank you for following. Um, and this is, this is the, the, the difficult thing is that teachers often feel threatened when people ask questions they don't know the answer to. And so then you get these teachers shutting down kids with legitimate questions, reasonable, real questions, because they don't know the answer because they don't have the background. Um, Skug it, thank you for following. And so what I found is by the time they get to middle school or even to algebra, they're so used to, be told, to being told just memorize it and to be faced with the extreme stress of performing on math exams that it's shut down their love of math. And this is like, if honestly, if I could put anything on a t-shirt, sorry, Hubble, like Hubble's cute. And yes, scaling your data is important. And yes, that should also be on a t-shirt. It would be that something, I don't know, some pithy way of saying students can't learn if they're afraid. Literally the parts of your brain that are receptive to knowledge and to forming those new connections. When you're in fight or flight, you cannot actively learn as well. Maybe for a little bit with the adrenaline or something, but if you're afraid, if you're stressed beyond belief, you cannot learn. I too, okay, so Dabs, you say you, you were a math tutor, K through 12, same. I've tutored everything, like I said, from like third grade all the way through multivariable calculus. Do you know what 90% of my job was? Okay, that's an exaggeration. 70% of my job was not teaching math. It was almost being like a therapist. It was getting these kids. I have seen literal like seven year olds with panic attacks about math. Something is deeply wrong if we are scaring little kids that bad about math that young. Like there is a deep failure happening and it bothers me. Like 
I remember one of my students, she's had such an amazing impression on me. She was really awesome. I tutored her for a year. And when I got, you know, when I started tutoring her, she was failing multiple classes. She firmly believed she was stupid and there was, you know, she, she had a learning disability as well, which, you know, schools aren't going to help you very much there. And she was failing, she was failing math. And she just was like, I'm bad at math. I was like, you're nine. How the hell do you know if you're bad at math yet? Are you kidding me? You think you're bad at, you're nine. You, you're not bad at anything. You haven't done anything. Like you're just learning. You can't just innately be bad. The vast majority of my work with her was just getting her confident enough to not panic and give up every time that she didn't immediately know the answer. And it's, it's those students who have fallen through the cracks, who get missed, who aren't just bright and gifted immediately, but actually are really smart they can do it. They work twice as hard, but just because they don't immediately get it, you know, they, they start to fail and they believe they're bad at things. I don't know. Uh, so Trav 11, thank you for following. And Feb Foxen, exactly. You say many of the students who come to college have already fallen through the cracks in elementary and high school. It's, it's, it's difficult. And Skugget, so you say, may I ask if your maths for ML series is going to be aimed for maths CS undergrads trying to learn ML on a deep level or general people? Oh no, it's not maths for ML. It's math. Like I said, we're starting with algebra. And if people are lost, if I start algebra day one and people are like, look, like I need more review, we'll go pre-algebra, we'll go, hell, I'll start with arithmetic. Like I'll go as, as down as we need to go because I'd rather, even if everyone walks in like, <laughs> like this is easy, it's just like five plus seven or something or fractions. I'd rather start with the things that scare people that they hate and build up the strongest foundation. So by the time we get to the multivariable calculus, you all are like, hell yeah, I know all this stuff wonderfully. I feel confident in it. This is just one, this is just the next step. It's not scary anymore. I wanna get to the point where I, I throw up a scary, you know, formula on the blackboard and there isn't the panic of, oh God, math, where you're like, okay, I'm gonna break it down. I know how to do this. Like, I want to do that together. Dazzy, thank you for following. Um, and not prof, you say you also get a lot of students who succeed who are ones who are good at remembering formulas and not really at solving problems. Exactly. Which is why, by the way, one of my, my techniques, at least, uh, this is what I taught my mom. For example, she was teaching um, surface area. And she was like, I can't get these kids to memorize all of these, all of these equations for surface area. And I was like, why? They just need to understand what the shape is. And then they can just derive it themselves. And she was like, what do you mean? So I went through cubes and cylinders and pyramids and all the other things. And I showed her that you don't need to memorize the goddamn equations. You just need to look at the shape and reason through it. And if you can reason through it, you can figure out anything. Also, why the hell do we have people memorizing formulae anyway? That's what Google is for. I'm sorry, you asked me any freaking formula in calculus. I don't really remember it, but I have applied math at the highest levels. And if I don't know something, I Google it. Wow. But guess what? I know how to reason through things and apply the math and figure it out. You don't need... You don't need to memorize formulae. That is just, I will I will die on that hill. Uh, Zeke721, thank you for following. <laughs> Ratios, yes, I fly Texas. Ratios, fractions, decimals, these are things that kids hate. We still hate them as adults. Why are they so scary? Why do they make it hard? We don't need to. Um, Dabs, yes, I, I, had, I had some students like that too. I had one student, literally, she was in algebra and the sides of her paper would be the tally marks because she had to still do that for addition and for multiplication. And virtual assistant, you, my friend, customize your own ca captions. So uh, have no fear. You can move the captions wherever you like. It's a great, it's a great little add-on that allows you to customize them with whatever font and size and wherever you want them. So, um, 
And Strawberry Jesus, you ask, how do you deal with people who are scared of failing and think they are bad because of not knowing the answer instantly, though? So there's a couple of things. It depends on their age. Um, usually what I do is with younger students, but actually this has worked with some high school students, I, I stop teaching them the math for a little bit. Because this is, this is something not a lot of people realize, is that teaching, you have to build trust. And building that trust takes time. But if you do build that trust, those students will follow you anywhere. They will trust you when you tell them something that makes no sense. They will trust, unfortunately, for some bad teachers. But they will also trust you when you show them something scary. They will trust you to explain it. Um, so the building the trust and getting rid of the anxiety, I find that the kids who have been the scaredest of math still love games and they love puzzles. And so, like... I had a kid who was really, really, really did not like math. So I'm not talking about Sudoku, like I've used that with some kids, but literally starting out with games, with things that are fun. And then once we've played a bunch of games together and we're having fun figuring out puzzles together, then you can start to introduce the math. But I find that a lot, of, a lot of the kids that are scared when they don't know the answer right away, it's because they've been tested to death. So you have to remove, like if you start out and you give that kid a problem and you say, go solve it, they're gonna shut down. Um, kid here, old lady, I guess. Kid here being like anyone of any age, really. The, the, a person who is younger than me that I am tutoring, though I have tutored people older than me as well. Um, and to, to prevent that shutdown, you have to remove the fear. And the fear comes from the feeling that they don't understand and they're a failure. Well, think to yourself for a second. If, if you're, if you're no post-college, you're, you're like an adult, maybe if, if you're a scientist, for example. What do scientists do? We live in the space that is the unknown. My literal goddamn job means I don't know anything every day. That's, my job is to start from the position of knowing nothing and work my way up. So one of the things that I also like to do, especially if they're older, so like, it's a little harder with the elementary schoolers, but still you can do that. Find something they're interested in. Start researching it. Show them that the process of research starts from not knowing. And then you can build from there. Like, it's okay to not know. It's okay to get it wrong. So by normalizing the mistakes and making those a good thing, awesome, we made a mistake, cool, now we know this isn't the right answer, let's go back and now we've learned something. You can change some of that process so when they make a mistake or they, they don't know immediately, it's not, it's not a panic. Um, oh my goodness, I'm not even gonna try with that name, but thank you for following uh, Left Jaw and KKKKKSSSD Seedon. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that's, that's tough though, is that at least as a tutor, I had to send them back to the classroom. So it was like in between the tutoring sessions, a lot of that work of helping them with their anxiety, helping them with the, you aren't stupid. Just cause you made a mistake doesn't mean you're stupid. Like all of that work that I would put in would get eroded by the teacher or get eroded by the tests in between sessions. I had one student, I actually did this quite a bit, is, I would tell them, if you look at the problem and you don't know how to do it and you start to panic, turn your sheet over and take, like I did box breathing, like inhale and count and exhale, inhale and count and exhale, then turn it back over, start to draw a picture, circle the things you know, underline the things you don't know. For each kid there was a different strategy, but it's like, you have to calm that panic response because the second you start panicking, your mind shuts down. I've done it though, literally. I walked out of one of my calculus exams in graduate school because I freaking panicked. My mind just shut down. I had studied, I turned it over, looked at it. It's like, I don't remember any of this. So I was like, I'm gonna go for a walk. So like went for a walk, got some water. Some teachers, especially like in high school and like middle school, public school, won't let you do that, of course, because they think you're cheating or something. 
I took a walk around the building, came back, sat down, and was like, okay, it's all right if I don't remember it. Let's see how much I can put on the paper. Let's see how far I can get. But it's just, I hate the whole idea of, of the way tests are done because they're so artificial. That's not how we use math. Even if you're a mathematician, that's not how you use math. Like, I remember in high school that what helped me fall in love with math is that my teacher would have more projects than tests. And hide, thank you for following. And like, she would, like, I remember this was, we were learning, I don't even remember the technical term for it, so, ooh. Um, we were learning this thing in, in, in calculus where you can, you can derive the volume of a complex shape by taking the equation that, that kind of marks one of the sides and rotating it around an axis in a certain way. And so that allows you in calculus to derive the volume of, of a complicated shaped object. Don't worry too much if you're like, oh God, I don't understand what's going on. Um, really, we were just trying to get the volume of something that was funky shaped. So we had, we had done the lecture, okay, whatever. And one morning, you know, I sit down, I sit down in calculus and the teacher comes in and she's got this like really weird face, right? It's like, oh, it's, got, it's got some like really weird, weird shapes, right? She sets it down on the table and she goes, get me the volume and walks out. She's like, yeah, you've got till Friday, walks out. And it was awesome because we were like, okay, it, it was this unsolved problem. So you could approach it mathematically. Like I think I, one of the first things I did was I pretended it was a cylinder and I was like, okay, since I'm filling in the edges, I know what my upper bound for a volume has to be if I get it as a cylinder, right? It's gotta be smaller than this. So I get my, my sanity check of like, if it's, if it's above this, I know I've done something wrong. You can fill it with water, absolutely. Um, she wanted it done in like the, the calculus approach, but it was just like this, this great moment where like I had something physical and tangible in my hands and I could, I could actually try to figure it out as best I could. And it wasn't going to be perfect, but she just wanted us to try and apply things. And I found that the more science you introduce in math, the more excited people get. If you give them a project to work on, to figure it out, they'll learn all the math in the world. It's when you sit there and you put a bunch of stuff on the board and it seems all abstract and divorced from reality that people are like, why am I sitting here looking at all of these Greek letters? What does this even mean? You know? So, um, oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> not theory, ooh. I think we're a little bit away from that, but that sounds cool. The thing is, this Gugget, I also like the more abstract stuff, actually. The, the, the area of math I did the worst at is geometry. Um, and the thing I did the best at was like the more theoretical proofs. But I found with other people, a lot of times, they need to see it in context. Even if it's theoretical, they need to see it applied to something. So like a lot of times when I teach um, trig, one of the first things I do is I show people parallax and why, why trig matters. Like this is a really cool application of trig that we can tell the distance to stars using trig. That's awesome. That's really, really useful. Um, Friedrich or, or Orber, thank you for following, or, or Reber. I'm not even gonna try. Really, virtual assistant? That's really cool. I mean, it makes sense intuitively. Reinforcement learning is where machine learning gets whack, in my opinion. That's where it gets co the coolest stuff is gonna be reinforcement learning. So I'm really excited. I can't wait for those days. <laughs> um. Yeah, given kittens, I don't know why I did so bad at geometry. Um, I tried very, very, very damn hard. I still am not not good at geometry. I don't like it. I had the, uh, I've got major a major case of algebra brain. <laughs> so usually, I guess that's what I've heard is that you do, often you do well at geometry or algebra. I don't know if that's true, but it's, it's, it's a, maybe an old wives tale I've heard, but. 
Um, East on Co, you say, one of my professors this semester was like, I don't believe in exams. Here's a podcast project. Get it in by the last day of finals. Exactly. Like, I much prefer projects because that allows the student, it, it's a lot less memorization and it allows them to really flex their creativity. So, and people being like, oh, like, how do you do, um, how do you do projects for math? Are you kidding me? Math is the language that governs the world. Like, there are plenty of projects for all areas of math, I assure you. Um, and given kittens, no, that doesn't mean you're bad at it. It just means you're rusty. We're all rusty at things we haven't done in a while, but it doesn't mean you're bad at it. Um, chasing a reward for being the best elevator. <laughs> Those of you who, who haven't done um, reinforcement learning, you're probably sitting here like, what is going on? Okay, so my friends, the way This is Titanic, isn't it? No. Okay, I thought it was a Titanic theme song. I'm sorry, and I was like, I thought we were listening to Christmas music. My bad. All right. Ooh, that was weird. Just for a second, I was kind of like, um, but this is definitely Christmas music. So, my friends, my dog sings for you at the end of stream. His name is Tennessee. He's a very good boy. He loves to sing for you. He gets very, very excited. So please, 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 please take a vote. Tell me what you want Tennessee to sing for you. And I'm going to go get him. Okay? So please don't go anywhere. I know there are so many of you in chat. He would love to know that he is singing for, for a big audience. He's a bit of a diva. Um, so give, give a vote as to the... Um, the wonderful uh, sci-fi theme that you would like my dog to sing for you. And I will be right back. I'm gonna go get him and get his treat. If I forget the treat, the world is over. So I will be right back.
All right, my friends, let me set up the camera here for you. Tennessee is here, you can see him right there. Um, let me get rid of my cropping filter so that you can see Tennessee in all of his glory. Oh, I know, Tim, you're a good boy. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let's get this down for you because you're a very good boy. All right. And let's move this little Hubble picture. I know, what are we singing? Let's see. Looks like Voyager. Everyone wants Voyager. Okay, Tim. Oh, he is ready. He was outside. <laughs> There's no song yet, Tan. Are you so excited? Are you so excited? Oh my god. He's so excited to sing for you tonight. He was literally outside my door when I walked out. Are you excited? <laughs> oh my god, he is so ready. Okay, Star Trek. Tennessee said. Deep breath that. Deep breath that. Voyager. Oopsies. Theme. Okay. Hold on, Ten. I know, there's an ad. Hold on, Ten. Okay. All right, volume warning. I'm going to turn the mic down, friends, but he, um... He does get a bit loud. Okay. Are you ready, Beth? <laughs> wow, you're ready. Thank you just for coming. Can I have a kiss? Thank you. Okay. Turkey for these boys. Good boys. Good lack of song, Hubble. Good song, Ted. You're good. Can I have another kiss? Hubble, kiss. Hubble, kiss. Thank you. Oh, you're such a good boy. And your bandage is still on. Good. All right. <laughs> I know. I love that. I love that Hubble came in too. He was like, I want a treat. Why does 10 get all the treats? <laughs> all right. So don't forget as, as the, um, as our schedule says here, we are looking for, um, let's, let's have a good, uh, a good stream tomorrow with anomaly detection. There have been a lot of requests for anomaly detection. So I am pretty excited to bring that to you. Um, let's also, let's, let's, let's raid a, um, a tiny stream. I like to raid small, small streams. Let me find a small stream. Um, let's see. 
Um, I don't want just chatting. I liked rating small streams with underrepresented people as the hosts, usually. Oh, Pumpkin Days! We've streamed Pumpkin Days. Let's go see how Pumpkin Days' is, um, game is coming along. So, please try to stick around if you can. All right. Um, let's stick around. Let's give a follow. Follow the raid train. <laughs> um, and I will see you tomorrow. All right. Have a good night, everyone.